That's great. So we should get started. Uh, so I am going to call the meeting to order. Uh, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And uh, we don't have a ton on the agenda tonight. Um, but I, I don't know of any um, reasons to change the order or add or subtract anything. Does anybody else have information to suggest we should? Nope. Okay. All right. So uh, not seeing that. So um, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. And then on to general business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment um, on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and so if you would um, say your name and where you live, um, that would be helpful. I'd try to keep your comments to about two minutes. That's helpful. And that's all of this is true. Um, if you make comments on a, a item that is on our agenda. And just so you know the structure, uh, well actually before I do that, um, if you would change your name to be um, your first and last name so that we can um, address you properly and have it uh, be recorded in the record properly. Um, and then um, also for your comments, um, generally how we do it is um, if uh, you have a uh, number of either comments or questions, you um, make them all at once and then we will either respond or not depending. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's how this works. Um, all right, uh, so comments and I see, um, oh yeah, to make a comment, you can either um, turn your camera on and um, uh, you know, wave at us or let us know that you want to speak or you can um, unmute yourself and let us know that way. Uh, or you can use the raise hand function, which is under reactions um, on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, so, okay, I think that's everything I needed to say. Um, and so Peter Kellman, I see that you have your hand up. Go ahead. Oh, you are muted still. Okay, now? Yes, now we can hear you, yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Peter Kelman. and I live on Mountain View Street in Montpelier. Tonight, I'd like to urge the city council to instruct the city manager to revisit his recent decision to expand the role and title of the community development specialist to include over all economic development and instead direct him to focus the role clearly on housing and to retitle the position accordingly. The reason for this is quite straightforward. I don't have to tell anyone on the council that housing related issues present the greatest challenges that most Montpelier residents face in their daily lives. Yet the city of Montpelier has no city department or staff member devoted to housing or even with the term housing in their title. Is it any wonder then that the many serious and interconnected housing related challenges listed in my written recommendations to city council and to this housing task force continue to worsen for Montpelier. One great place to begin to more effectively address these challenges would be for the city to have a housing development specialist on staff, someone whose primary responsibility would be housing. The specialist would be charged with collecting, analyzing and reporting up-to-date and reliable information on all housing related issues as they may apply to Montpelier, as well as descriptions and validated findings of model approaches to such challenges taken elsewhere. Just as importantly, the housing specialist would actively pursue every possible avenue to increase the number of homes available for ownership and the number of well-maintained dignified apartments available for rent in Montpelier especially those priced to be affordable for working people. In order to accomplish this, the housing specialist would need to work closely with local homeowners, landlords, and large property owners, as well as with reputable developers, architects, designers, engineers, and builders who know and understand Montpelier, and critically important with other staff, especially in the planning and community development and public works departments. Sound like too much for one person? almost certainly, and yet the outgoing community development specialist was charged with pretty much all those functions, except that he also had to do so for commercial development. 
And now the city manager proposes to layer onto this the overall economic development responsibilities that the entire Montpelier Development Corporation struggled to manage for the past five years. And the job description just posted for this position lists 32 essential job functions, quote, intended to illustrate many, but not necessarily all of the duties that the CED specialist may encounter during one's tenure, end quote. Please, I implore you, instruct the city manager to find some way to devote an appropriately staffed and appropriately titled position to the myriad housing challenges Montpelier faces today. Doing so would not only increase the likelihood of making real progress on housing matters, but would also send the right kind of signal to Montpelier residents, homeowners, renters, landlords, and would-be developers. That message, Montpelier is serious about housing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good to know. Um, uh, Vicki Ann Lane, um, would you like to uh, go ahead? I just have a question. Um, uh, I see Chief Pete is on. Is that correct? Are you here? Uh, he's here, but go ahead and ask your question. And let's. Um, yeah. Actually, the city manager could. I was just curious about the cruiser that was on Sherwood Drive. Is it dead? Is there anything further to your question? No, uh, Vicky just wanted to no sure. I was just curious about it because it got covered with snow. Okay. Um, and uh, Chief, do you want to speak to that? You yes, can, the, if you'd like. Yes, ma'am. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, no, the, the cruiser, I have it parked uh, to make up for parking spaces because of all the snow um, around the station, as well as I use that, that vehicle for um, traveling back for emergencies uh, when I'm on when I'm working late at night, if there's an emergency call that comes in. So recently there is a, a, an electric short in and I have to keep charging the battery every day. Good to know, thank you. Um, and just to, to go back, sorry, um, um, Peter, I didn't make a comment on, on yours, but I, um, I wanna at least say that your point is well taken and I think it deserves further um, conversation. Um, so, uh, and then I thought I saw somebody else's hand, um, but I think their uh, hand is down now. Away. Yep, um, just checking here. Um, okay, so uh, Steve Whitaker, go ahead. Uh, I, I know Peter Kelman's well-prepared speech ran well over two minutes, but uh, I appreciate that uh, he got recognized and deserve further discussion, which is something I rarely get from this council, uh, despite the merits of all my arguments. Uh, I'm asking that the city manager contract renewal not be done on the consent agenda. That is a nearly million dollar uh, budget item over the next four years. And it is inappropriate for that type of business to be done on a consent agenda. Secondly, missing public records. Uh, you're going to keep hearing about them until we address them. They have not been uh, re replied to or uh, certified as being non-existent. Uh, the city center bathrooms uh, conditions, the uh, records regarding Montpelier ceasing to become a peace app in 2008, uh, the Axon taser, uh, combined taser and body camera proposal, the capital fire mutual aid contract for two years, which are missing and still haven't been produced. The police technology plan, which has not been produced, nor uh, maybe it has been certified non-existent, but that's telling in itself and merits further discussion. Uh, and the Motorola proposal, which is the subject of budget things, budget items we're being asked to vote on and approve when we have not seen what is being purchased with that uh, money. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, I am not seeing um, anybody else at this point. Um, so uh, 
we are going to move on then to um, the consent agenda. Um, there was a request to remove the city manager's uh, contract renewal, and we um, could do that, but I'll leave that up to the council as to whether or not, whether or not you want to do that. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? And then we'll take comments on it. Um, and I, I'll uh, get to you there um, at that point, uh, Peter. Uh, Jack. I move the consent agenda as is. I second. Okay, uh, there's a motion and a second. Further discussion, um, Peter Kelman, go ahead. You're muted. Yep. Uh, yeah, you are muted, sir. Sorry. That's okay. One of my mute, unmute put things works and one apparently doesn't. Um, would it be possible to take um, item D out of the consent agenda, the homelessness task force re-explanation? I, I, I mean, unless everybody understands it, I, I, I don't understand what this is about. I mean, you guys all understand it, but I'm not sure the public does. And maybe the public doesn't need to, but it would be nice to understand it better. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, um, one possibility is that we could talk about it briefly now without removing it, um, or we could remove it. Uh, would anybody like to remove it to talk about it? Okay. Um, Jack, I think, I go ahead. I think it's fine to remove it if there's serious questions or even public interest, I think it's fine to take it out. Okay. Um, yes, Cameron, go ahead. I could also, um, as staff representative for the Homelessness Task Force, sort of give an overview. And if that, maybe that will answer some questions. And if it doesn't, I, I just wanna make sure that information is, is out there if okay. needed. Um, what do you think, Jack? That's fine. Um, okay, um, Cameron Niedermeyer is our assistant city manager. Um, uh, go ahead and then and then maybe after your um, uh, explanation, we can decide whether or not we want to pull it off of the agenda if it serves a separate vote. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, um, council members and the mayor. I appreciate that. Um, thanks for your question, uh, Peter. So the ask on the budget or the consent agenda right now from the homelessness task force is coming back from a recommendation that the council approved back in October of last year. The homelessness task force had come forth with six separate projects, some short-term and some long-term to council and asked for some additional funding to get these projects done. Some of them were short-term like getting people emergency hotel rooms, some were uh, getting some money freed up to extend the hours at the transit center so folks had a warm place to go between public buildings closing and um, the shelter opening. But one of the things that they had asked for was some additional funding to pay a consultant to help the city at large come up with a concrete plan to get us to what our community needs to um, do and that what we can do, what is within our capacity to do as far as supporting homeless folks. So people experiencing homelessness have said that they would like a day shelter. We've also talked very much about public restrooms in our downtown and the need for um, things like uh, shower facilities and ba public bathrooms. So all of those things um, have sort of come up and bubbled up in a lot of conversation. And what the Homelessness Task Force wanted to do was hire a consultant to help us figure out what that actually means in concrete terms. What what do we need a building? Do we need uh, a partnership with someone else that we just had available? didn't know about and what is it going to cost? And we don't have that right now. We don't have a plan that's sort of built out to give us costs of what we could do within our current capacity and what we should be doing, right? If we need a day shelter, what does it look like? We need someone to help us figure that out. So this would be in conjunction with a survey that um, is currently being done by the continuum of care in um, interviewing the folks who are um, experiencing homelessness in our actual community, telling us what they need in our actual community. So hopefully building off of that to get a recommendation, and that would be what the consultant is for. And so council had asked for more clarity on that ask. And so this is the homelessness task force giving further clarity. 
the funding has already been approved. This is just giving further clarity and sort of asking for permission to move forward with the RFP process, uh, which is yet to be written. So that was a very long explanation. Hopefully that sort of touched on all the points. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any thoughts from council on removing this item? Okay, I am not seeing any. So um, any further discussion on the consent agenda? Okay. Um, uh, yes, Jack. Yeah, I'm Bob. sorry. I, I'm sorry. I seem to keep jumping in a, a little late. Um, what, one of the things I uh, I just wanted to mention is that uh, you know part of our consent agenda is uh, is a replacement of uh, of a truck for public works. Is that a vehicle that uh, would have been not possible to uh, would have been possible to get an electric uh, version of it if uh, if we'd had more time? I see you see some shaking hand, heads. We do. We, no, we don't believe so. And obviously this was due to an accident. Um, and so we were, we've accelerated that. I, if DPW is on, it can add more. But I, I, as I understand it, there was no electric option. That was what I figured given the, it was presumably the size of the vehicle. But uh, since we're interested in converting our fleet, I always like to be conscious of that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question, Jack. Um, Okay, Sarah, any other comments? I have a comment. Um, yes, go ahead, Steve Whitaker. Now? Yep, we can hear yeah. you. Uh, being, that, being that the uh, criteria was uh, necessary discussion and interest for uh, the uh, homelessness item, I would support Peter's request that that be pulled off for discussion because I was form instrumental in forming that task force three years ago, two and a half years ago. And secondly, uh, reiterating the request that the city manager's contract million dollar contract which has not been discussed it was only sh shown in draft appeared in the packet uh i got it today and there's new language in it there's a longer term than prior uh and so it's just it's, it's inappropriate to move forward with that on the consent agenda okay thank you um any further discussion or any changes folks want to make? Okay, I'm um, hearing none. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? All right, so the consent agenda passes and we are gonna move on then to our, our first um, budget informational meeting. Um, so uh, for, this item, um, um, Bill, would you like to, or Cameron, would you like to uh, kick us off? And then just so folks know um, how this will go, if folks have comments specifically on the budget, um, we will take those comments um, after. Uh, so go ahead. Yeah, so for, for some of you that have been to a few of these, this will look somewhat familiar. Um, there's There are some updates in it, but it's the same basic uh, outline of the budget and the bonds. We also have a special, a more detailed uh, outline on the Elk, proposed Elks Club purchase bond. If people, if the council and public are interested in it, it is included in this presentation as well. Um, so we have those two. So I'll, I'll go through those as we have in the past. And of course, happy to, uh, Myself and staff are happy to answer any questions about any of the budget items and the bonds. Of course, the council can answer questions and receive any comment. So I will be sharing my screen. Hopefully that will work. Can I uh, interrupt you for a second, Bill? You sure can. Um, so do you have a separate presentation about the other bonds? Yeah, it, the, so, excuse me. So all the, the, um, the presentation includes the, the budget overview and all the bonds. And oh, okay. Tax rate. Okay, so in maybe the event, we'll do... in the event that people want a more detailed presentation about the Elks Club one, we have one prepared, but we okay. aren't necessarily planning to use it unless it, it's asked for. Okay, I just want to make so... sure people knew that it was available. 
Yep, that's good. And um, just so I can be clear with the public too. Um, so if the presentation is sort of all together, then um, we'll afterwards take comments on both the budget and the bonds. Um, just because you know they had been listed as separate items. So thank you. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, go and, ahead. And if you wish, Madam Mayor, I certainly can go through the budget and stop when we get to the bonds. Uh, I, and, okay. So that actually, I would prefer that unless other folks have strong feelings about that. No. Okay. Uh, all right. I, I think that makes sense. That way we can sort of um, keep the, keep them kind of separate. Um, Okay, go go ahead. Okay, I'm just trying to find what I'm looking for right now, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is always an interesting uh, interesting thing here. Um, where would I, if it's on my desktop, Cameron? Where would I find it? Uh, that's an interesting question on your desktop. Um, <laughs> I, it would be there. Um, can you open your folders and go to a recent? That's what, I, that's what I'm trying to figure out right now. I thought I had this all, all set. Um, hold on just a minute. Best laid plans. <laughs> I know, sorry. Uh, let's see here. I'm, unfortunately, I'm not in Montpelier, so um, I can't even get help. Um, Cool. Why don't you take five, <laughs> please? Sure. Well, I'm trying to think if, like, if we can take up um, any of the other items. Sure. There you go. Do this. So one possibility is that um, we could take up the uh, parklet ordinance, um, which is um, after scheduled to be after those things. Um, and uh, I think I got it. Oh, did you? Okay. I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm almost there. Yep. Hang on. Uh, let's see. Let's try this. I would say we could do council reports, but I don't want to say goodbye to Jay too am early. I, am I up there? Yep. What's that? Yes, you are. Yay. Um, okay. So here we go. Uh, so this is the um, actually third public hearing. We had two in, in the preparation of the budget and now this is uh, a required hearing um, within so many days of the town meeting vote. We're supposed to hold a public informational session on the, on the budget and on bonds. Uh, so given the conversation this year, it certainly seemed uh, nice. Okay, wait, but now why am I not, why is this not advancing? Hold on, I think I got it. Okay, so uh, as we entered the budget, we had specific goals in mind, uh, which included implementing the strategic plan, rebuilding from the COVID cuts. And again, that's a, that's a good opportunity for me to remind people that um, last year's budget was actually a reduction from the prior year. So we, we had a minus budget. So uh, I know there's been some talk about our budget increasing 9.7% this year, which is a fact. Um, but it is actually a 7% increase from two years ago. So an average of about 3.5% a year, which is not that abnormal for us given various costs. Uh, so we are coming back from a, a reduced budget. Obviously delivering a resp uh, responsible services all the way around, addressing our challenges with revenues, as I've mentioned before, and we'll mention again, they are we're way down, they're coming back. Some of them are not all the way back and to stay within our inflation rate. It's, uh, it's actually a little bit higher than this, but in December when we were making the budget in January, the number was 7%. And uh, I think the council, the final, well, we'll get to that. So revenues, we have uh, our full payment in lieu of taxes from the state uh, funded um, in that it was great news last year that really helped us a lot. We had budgeted for a much more reduced amount and got the full, full payment, uh, which made a big difference. Uh, and again, for those, uh, there is occasionally people do say that we don't get any money from the state for property taxes. And I think it's important to note that we get 1.25 million from the state for property uh, payment in lieu of property taxes. We have uh, $253,000 budgeted for our rooms, meals, and alcohol taxes. 
that's good news in, in that it's an improvement from the year before. It's uh, still not as high as it was pre-pandemic. Uh, the highway, state highway aid went up last year and is projected to stay the same. So again, that is up quite a bit from what we had budgeted. Our building permits are stabilized. Um, so we've got them in at about 75,000. That's still down from about 100,000 normally. So the net increase for all of these items is 488,000. Some of that is what uh, we may get asked later what made up that one time $435,000 uh, that we used for capital money in the, the prior year's budget. But this is, uh, this is one of the benefits. So just covering those increases uh, and getting our budget back to where it was is a percentage of increase on the budget, which isn't necessarily a tax increase. So I think people need to under, you know, it's helpful to understand that. So we've mentioned the strategic plan and I know uh, we all here understand it, but many people who may be watching don't. So the city council goes through a process in the fall um, with where we spend two or three meetings really going through identifying priorities and action steps and uh, specific initiatives underneath all of those. But the main strategies are to improve community prosperity, provide responsible and engaged government, create more housing, practice good environmental stewardship, build, maintain, uh, sustainable infrastructure and improve public health and safety. So when we look at our budget, when we look at our operations, we try to see how they are structured around them. And if people that watch, read the city manager's weekly memo uh, know that it is structured around these uh, goals. So our first one, improved community prosperity. We included $50,000 for economic development and um, this is probably a, a moment to slightly address the points that Mr. Kelman raised. Uh, we don't expect the, that position to do everything with regard to economic development. The, the $50,000 is to do a strategic plan and also to purchase for us to contract with professionals when needed um, and to supplement the staff expertise. Uh, so there would be some real fine work, uh, you know, more detailed things that are over our heads uh, that we currently, that perhaps um, the Montpelier Development Co Corporation used to do and we would contract out. We would not dump it all on the hands of one employee. Uh, so uh, child care was a high, uh, um, a high priority that is included in the feasibility for the rec center, regardless of its location. But currently, as we look at the Outs Club, we really see an opportunity to expand child care opportunities there. That's less, uh, less, op I'll talk much, Bill. There are not as many options at the current site uh, because of its site restrictions. We have an additional outdoor recreation proposed, we, uh, obviously through our various parks and rec budgets, but also through the Elks Club, a proposed Elks Club bond. We continued $45,000 for the homelessness task force, it was the same as last year. We continued $131,000 for the community fund, uh, which supports uh, nonprofit organizations that provide help, uh, pr primarily assistance to needy individuals um, and individuals in crisis. We maintain 32,600 to Montpelier Live to promote our downtown. And we have put in $10,000 for the Montpelier Arts Fund. That is an increase of zero from zero from last year. It's a decrease from 20,000 in prior years. The next goal of uh, providing responsible and engaged government. Um, one of the things that was important to the city council was that we have fully staffed city departments and we do. We have $25,000 for a website upgrade and are just getting some proposals in now to look at that. Uh, and uh, we certainly have received a lot of uh, expressions of concern about that and we agree. And so we're hoping we can uh, do a lot with that. We have continued 10,000 uh, for the capital area neighborhoods. It was 20,000 last year. We'll probably be 20,000 next year, uh, but this 10,000 and the 20,000 will cover an 18 month span until the time we are doing our next month budget, so that should work. We have 130,000 in there to, uh, for our ADA transition plan to actually put in projects and, uh, and make improvements to make things more accessible for people. We have $75,000 for uh, public communications data. Uh, this is being paid for with ARPA funds. This would include a, a community survey. It would include some software to better explain uh, uh, some of our projects for people. Uh, and to try to create some more interaction with the public to uh, allow for that. Um, we have talked about equity for people and uh, the, our uh, committee that handles that has recommended that we play, pay a stipend for volunteers on committees. So the city council has included $30,000 for that. 
We've also included $15,000 for professional advocacy at the legislature. And essentially our uh, sort of nuts and bolts services are fully restored, police, fire, public works, et cetera. So with our full staffing and our funding back to sort of a normal budget, we are at the, uh, you know, we're not, we can't be all things to all people, but we're at what we consider full, fully functional. So toward the, uh, the goal to create more housing, um, we have put in 110,000 for the housing trust fund. Uh, last year, we only put 50,000 in. So we, in, in the budget, we've got the full 110,000. And then we are also restoring 60 that was not put in last year's budget from our budget. So basically make last year whole as well as this year's, uh, the whole $110,000. In addition, the $2 million proposed bond for the Elks Club is partially to go for housing. Uh, and the extent to which to be defined as we go forward. Practice good environmental stewardship. We've included $100,000 to fully implement our net zero plan. Uh, now that we have one, uh, we've ha had the goal for some time and now we have a plan and now we need to go forward with it. In our uh, one of our bonds, we are doing the first major project highlighted in that plan, which is to convert the uh, our DPW garage to uh, pellet heating and save uh, the fossil fuels there. We've got money in ARPA for, uh, and I've mentioned ARPA a couple of times, it's an American uh, Rescue, uh, plan, Rescue Plan Act. So that is the one-time money that came to states and cities for uh, the pandemic. So $34,000 of dam removal uh, seed money. Uh, we've looked at uh, wanting to potentially remove some of the dams in the North Branch and in the Winooski Rivers. We understand that the new infrastructure bill, if we ever get guidance on it, um, we'll have uh, some money for dam removal. We're hoping we can use this either for studies or matching funds. We've continued to fund the My Ride uh, from GMT at $40,000. And we have in one of the bonds uh, $600,000 to, uh, to help fund the uh, River Confluence Park. Um, our key goal is to maintain, build and maintain sustainable infrastructure. We're putting more into infrastructure in this year's budget than we ever have. Our capital and equipment plan funding uh, is at 2.15 million, which is about 250,000 below where we'd like to be on an annual basis. However, it's supplemented with about 2.5 million in ARPA and capital reserve funding. Uh, and that isn't counting the four bonds. So about $4.6 million capital investment um, right there, and more coming later in the presentation, more detail on that. Uh, improving public health and safety. Uh, we have expanded uh, capacity for the social worker for the public uh, associated with the police department. We've included body-worn cameras. Uh, in the FY22 budget, included funding for dispatch consoles. They haven't been purchased yet, so we're carrying that money forward. Uh, most of the uh, Police review committee recommendations have been included. We did just did an update with the council a meeting or two ago about what where things were. Uh, the crisis intervention training is included in the operating budget. And we have 425,000 identified in ARPA for housing services, uh, hub public bathrooms. I think more definition will be coming for that, but it's to address uh, some of those critical needs in the community. So we talked a little bit about capital improvements and infrastructure. We have a plan, uh, which, so our capital plan includes our debt service, how much we're putting annually and our equipment. And, it, and then we basically have a total target. So if you look down, if you go back a couple of years to the, the column for FY20, you can see we were at 2.375 million where it says total budget. And that was really our target of where we wanna be and then let me perhaps slowly grow that by inflation. Then in FY21, because of the impact of COVID, we had to make some slashes. You can see we cut that drastically uh, by 668,000. And then in FY22, the, even though on paper, the budget went up by 200,000, you can see it was still um, $400,000 below where we'd like to be in our target. So that led to a lot of delayed projects, equipment purchases and the, and the like. So this year it's back up to 2.15 million essentially. It's increased by 223,000. It still is about 225,000 below the 2.375. So we will be looking to address that next year. Um, so we're, what are we doing with the, the million dollars that we're proposing to use this year? 
uh, take 590,000 of it, put it on streets and roads to improve the conditions of those, uh, short and long-term, uh, rebuild, fix, et cetera. Another 230,000 in buildings and grounds, that includes the 130,000 for ADA compliance, 68,000 for parks and trees, 63,000 for sidewalks, again, supplemented with other funds for other projects. Uh, this is specifically for sidewalks. Many of the other projects include sidewalks when we're fixing the adjacent street. Uh, 27,000 for bridge maintenance, $20,000 for transportation and $75,000 for project management to help. Uh, that includes technical services, et cetera, to help get all the rest of these projects completed. We also have uh, about $360,000 in equipment. 109 of that is for fire and EMS. Those are essentially payments on fire trucks and ambulances. Uh, $95,000 for two police cruisers, excuse me, $95,000 for DPW vehicles, $76,000 for two police cruisers. And um, the reason we're getting two is we haven't bought any the last two years. Normally we get one per year. So we are behind and seeking to uh, catch up. $53,000 for our information technology infrastructure, which is real essential for us, and $26,000 for parks. So now we get into the ARPA money, the American Rescue Plan Act money, part one. So uh, one, the first 1.1 million was received by the city this fall, and it was very clear that it could be used for uh, lost revenue, uh, which meant Basically, any, anything that we could document we had, had that had, was lost revenue. So, uh, and as the prior chart showed, there had been plenty of it. Um, so, we've uh, aligned $620,000 for delayed roads, bridges, retaining walls, and $420,000 for deferred equipment purchases, and $60,000 to restore the housing trust fund. So, again, playing catch up from the last couple of years. Um, part two uh, is the new money, which we expect to get this fall. Uh, it originally came with some very tight restrictions for what it could be done. Those have since been loosened, um, and it, that happened during the budget process. So we've, we've continued with our current plan. We may or may not choose to adjust it as we go forward, because I, 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 in my personal opinion, obviously, it doesn't really, my opinion doesn't really count. It's the council's opinion that counts, but it does seem to address uh, the, the priorities that we've established for the community. So this is the 75000 for the community outreach that we talked about earlier. The 425,000 for homelessnesses, homelessness issues, housing, public bathroom, et cetera. $50,000 for an electric vehicle charging station for city vehicles. Not This is not for the public, although perhaps with the more flexible use, we could realign that if that's something we saw. Um, and then $450,000 for water and sewer improvements. We know we have aging water and sewer infrastructure and we've been trying to, we have a long-term plan for building that up. And so uh, the plan is to use Good portion of this ARPA money to accelerate that plan and get some more water and sewer lines improved. Uh, and then in addition, because as, as you heard, I mentioned we got some revenues in that we hadn't uh, anticipated. Uh, so we actually had a reserve in capital funds of, that had been created because we had budgeted money, cut the projects because we didn't think we were going to get the money, then we got it. So the, the money was in reserve. So we're adding 180000 to paving funds uh, to them funds that were already in the budget, bringing us up to a total of 760,000 for road paving. Uh, 750,000 per year is the recommended amount to reach the paving level, the, the street quality level uh, that we would like to be at, uh, obviously sustained over years, not just a one year, but this is be the first time we've actually funded this fully at the pavement condition index um, target. Uh, 221,000 in equipment, and then the aforementioned 34,000 for dam removal. So the two ARPA funds, 2.2 million in ARPA funds, the 435,000 uh, here uh, all come up to 2.6 million in investment in infrastructure above and beyond the 2.15 in our normal budget. So there it is, that's our total capital. As you can see, we've got about 2.3 million going into various infrastructure projects, another million uh, in our equipment and 560,000 into community-based needs. So about 4 million in all. So that's not including the proposed bonds um, for the community investment. So now I'm at the section on the bonds, Mayor. Um, if you'd like, I can pause here and we can talk about the budget. Um, yeah, I, I think we 
probably should, um, if that is okay. So if you wouldn't mind um, stopping sharing your screen. Um, I wanna just check in with folks. Um, so um, because this is a, a public hearing, we're gonna officially um, open the public hearing on this. Um, and uh, if you have comments or questions on this, and now is the time, if you'd say your name, where you live, um, try to keep your comments to two minutes. Um, I suspect there may be a number of people who may want to comment. And, um, and if you have something, if you have a number of questions or comments to make, if you could um, put them all together and then we will make a note of that and um, um, respond appropriately. Uh, okay, so um, Peter Kelman, I see you've got your hand up, go ahead. Did I get my mute right this time? Yes, you did. Okay, uh, first of all, I, I, I would just like to say that um, Bill, I, I think you've done a fantastic job with this budget, I really do. I wish more people understood that. And that is a problem that I hope we can all work on together in the coming year so that next year there, we don't get these misunderstood um, issues that we have this year. Um, that said, I do have a, just a couple of comments um, the first is, as you know, because I've written you about this, I don't think you have enough money in there to replace the website. That website is so old and so creaky and so useless that fixing it is not enough. The second thing is that um, I'm, it's, I'm all for pellet furnaces, but they are not, they, they produce carbon dioxide carbon dioxide. They may not be fossil fuels, but they're not the cleanest energy in the world. And I, I just hope that we know what we're doing there. The third thing is that um, I think you said something very cool about EV charging station. And this is a kind of creative thinking you need to do. Yes, it's intended for city vehicles, but if we're gonna transition lower income people to electric cars, how about thinking about that as a kind of a form of subsidy? If they get, can get an electric car, they can charge for free at, at, you know, in the future. We, we've got to figure out a way to help lower income people to make the move to, 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 elect, to electric vehicles. And then finally, I, I, I must have missed what the community outreach is, but maybe that's related to my first point. Um, I, you know, I'm a big fan of CAN. I participated in CAN in two different neighborhoods. I've been after Anne about CAN for about five years <laughs> before she was mayor. Um, I think they're the key to community involvement, community engagement and communication. We need to really make it more robust. There are not CAN coordinators in every neighborhood. Some of the neighborhoods are just much too big, but I really hope that you as a city council will model how CAN can be used. All you city councilors, you should be talking to with uh, regularly with the CAN coordinators in, in, in your districts. Get, to, get them to put out the news, explain the budget. They can explain the budget maybe to their people, their neighbors, and get their neighbors to tell them things, to tell you what they want for their neighborhood. I think that, uh, that that's my dream for CAN. Uh, and even though it's not strictly a budget item, you know, the budget item is community outreach. And I just hope that you'll find a way to work at CAN into that. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, other comments about the budget or questions? You can either um, raise your hand using the raise hand icon um, or uh, turn your camera on and wave or um, just unmute yourself and let us know you wanna speak. Um, anybody else? Okay, I'm not seeing, oh, uh, Jay, go ahead. Bill, I just didn't, I didn't know if you wanted to clarify uh, Peter's questions in terms of a new website relative to the community outreach piece that's part of the ARPA funds. Um, I think that Peter, you're absolutely right. The, that, that initial piece that's in the budget, 
that's not even close to rebuilding the website. So, but this is, you know, and I think Bill's been looking at ways to improve it and make it more manageable. The, the money that is in the ARPA funds is um, in response to something that I had brought to Bill a while ago that would look to um, move all of the pieces. You know, obviously the city website does a lot of work. You know, not only is it about engaging with the community, but it also has to be an online presence for doing the business and running the city. Right. So the community outreach piece is looking at a way to um, organize and improve the community, the community, the community outreach part of the website. So um, looking at a way that where there are issues, where there's development projects and and all of these types of questions that happen, all those could exist in one space that would that would have a, a cleaner interface with city staff and with um uh, and with the city website. So that's, it's kind of broken up in pieces. And obviously we don't want to get too far into the weeds on this, but I just want you to know that that's that thinking is figuring out ways to make sure that we have a, the city has a web presence that can best support the communication with everybody in the community. So Bill, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but that's sort of the, the big picture thinking about those two, two pieces of funding. Yeah, if I could just follow up on that too quickly. Thank you, uh, Jay and Peter. Um, the, so we do plan to, I say overhaul, I think we plan to replace the website and, and bring in a new one. Um, you know, unlike years past, municipal websites are not uh, new now. Uh, there are lots of them. And so it is, a, you know, there is a, uh, I don't know, if, oh, templates the right word, but the there are products that can be had. We all we have a, an online, and in addition, we have an IT contractor who manages all of our IT, and they build websites for municipalities. Uh, and so we are looking, talking to them about, uh, you know, they're already a partner with us, so uh, pulling over our information, rebuilding. So we actually do think we can do that with pretty close to the money that we have. Um, maybe not exactly, but it's uh, we we're, we're conf we feel pretty good about that. Um, and we have some room with the 75,000. Um, as Jay mentioned, we're also looking at developing some other uh, ways to talk with the public. Uh, one of them is to is actually have a, a full um, community survey. We did one in 2009 that was very su uh, successful and we haven't done it since. Um, and I think this is, was a good opportunity to update information and really get a sense of people's needs, priorities, how they feel about city services, et cetera, get some reaction uh, and, and specifically ask questions about where people go to get information. You know, we all make assumptions that it might be the bridge or it might be the Times Argus or it might be Front Porch Forum or it might be wherever. So, you know, let's ask people where exactly, you know, where are their priorities? Where do they go to get these things? So um, that's all part of it. And then looking at, as Jay mentioned, some software that could split out some of the city projects that people can learn more about and or uh, have more interaction functions with people so we can get more real-time feedback from the public. So, um, you know, that's today's world. We're trying to figure out how to move into that with our, our resources. So those together are really $100,000 toward that end. And I think certainly CAN is an important piece of that. Um, and how we integrate them into that is... Um, yeah. So. Yeah, if I can, oh, unless you were not done. Oh, I'm uh, done. Okay, I want to piggyback on that as well and say, um, you know, I'm glad that the Capital Area Neighborhoods is up and running now, and um, I, I think uh, the the councils as well as the um, staff's relationship with CAN hopefully will continue to grow and evolve over time as we um, sort of get used to the idea that, that CAN exists, which is great. Um, but I uh, appreciate you bringing that up and um, uh, you know, reminding us that we need to be um, intentionally getting information uh, to CAN leaders. So thank you very much. Um, other comments or questions um, specifically about the budget? city budget. Okay, um, I, I see a person um, called MP, but if you would say your um, first and last name uh, and where you live, uh, and that would be really helpful. Uh, go ahead.
Um, Cameron, I'm wondering if this person has the ability to unmute themselves. They should. Okay. So, uh, MP, we would love to hear from you um, if you can unmute yourself. Um, for now, though, it looks like maybe we should go to uh, Didi Brush. Uh, go ahead, Didi. Hi. Um, thank you all. Um, I am particularly interested in the bonds, and I think I understood from what Bill Fraser said a little bit ago was that this is going to be um, addressed later in the meeting. Am I correct about that? Yes, that's next. Okay. And um, the only thing that always, you know, I, I've been guilty of not being a very attentive uh, citizen as far as the various line items in the budget. But one of the ones that always <laughs> catch it, catches my attention is the equipment budget. And, um, you know, it, you know, there's a little here and a little there. And I just wonder how, how does one, how does a department determine the need for more equipment other than, well, we've had it for four years and it needs to be replaced or it, it could somebody elaborate on that? Certainly. We, so we have an equipment plan um, that is, we, we have a, an annual funding level, which we are not, which we are going back up to. We had to cut it. That's why, that's why this year you're seeing equipment popping up in two or three different places because we're using ARPA money and reserve money to catch up from prior years. But normally all our major equipment is in our capital plan. It's a little over half a million. And uh, we, it's planned out pretty far in advance. Uh, we look at life cycle of vehicles. So it includes, that includes, you know, fire trucks, ambulances, police cruisers, uh, information technology equipment, all the DPW various vehicles, the trucks, the graders, the, the you know, the, the loaders, the sidewalk plows. Uh, so, it, you know, the recreation pickup trucks and mowers and parks, you know, it, 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 when you think about the amount of equipment the city uses for various things it, it, that, you know, it goes pretty fast, actually, particularly the cost of them. So um, each department is responsible for mapping out their needs and, and the useful service uh, of yeah, a vehicle. Yeah. You know, some like a fire truck last, you know, the big trucks last 20 to 30 years. So we typically will bond for one of those and they, they last us for a long period of time. The ambulances are on a five year cycle for the, um, the box and a 10 year cycle for the chassis. Uh, so that's a that's a set thing. DPW uh, really. In, in fact, we get more life out of our vehicles and we're usually able to sell them because we maintain them so well. Uh, that we often have success selling them to other municipalities as 10 year old used vehicles that they're delighted to get because they're in such good condition. And so that helps us offset the cost of our replacement vehicle. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty detailed science and, uh, and, even that, and even that I would say typically in a budget time, the requests come in and exceed the amount that we have. So we then as a group have to to prioritize what goes into the council. And, and as you saw this year, um, the, uh, because we had to cut things out last year, we're just catching up on things because they're- Okay, I understand. And, and are the sales of the used equipment shown? I assume it must be shown in the revenue side somewhere. Yes. Okay, I, I didn't- And often, indeed, to be, nope, no problem. And to be fair, we don't usually budget for, sale of revenue, you know, we, when it comes, it's, you know, it's part of the factor of buying the next truck or the next piece of vehicle, but oh, okay. we, we wouldn't necessarily budget and say, we're expect to get X for okay. sale. It's just, it's a nice, it's, it helps when it happens. And I sort okay. of agree, I, I um, last comment, I'm sorry. Okay. The, the CAN um, initiative, um, as a, as a resident, I was not, whoops, excuse me, spam risk. Um, I was not particularly informed about this, the CAN initiative. And I sort of ran into them as I walked around town. And so I think that if you're finding that it's an effective communication tool, um, 
it would behoove the city council or the city councilors or the marketing or what have you arm of the city to to make that more um, visible because I don't think it's pretty, well, from my point of view, it's not particularly well known. That that could be, um, uh, that could be not very accurate. But I also think that the ones that I see around town, they tend to not be very updated very frequently. So if you're gonna do it, it needs to be more robust. And um, I don't know whether that's a, bus, but a budget issue or what it is, but um, it's, a, it's a nice concept, but it needs to be more vibrant in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just thank you that, um, for those comments. Um, they're well taken. Um, and, uh, but just for context, uh, for future um, commenters, uh, we do try to keep our comments or questions sort of all together. Um, oh, if you can, okay. it's, it's okay, no worries. Um, and so uh, just just for uh, context or uh, uh, clarification there. Um, I anyone I else? I, th I thought it was all about the budget, so forgive me. Oh, no, it is. But, uh, but uh, the idea would be to um, have your, your comments about can and the thing sort of to, and the, um, uh, equipment, the equipment, um, sort of together. Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, that's okay. That's okay. No worries. Um, Carol Welch, go ahead. Um, hi, I just need a quick clarification. Is the, I, well, I've, I've been looking at it online probably more than it's good for my mental health, but it's not clear to me whether that the, I seem to understand that the, the debt service for the four um, items that we need to vote on separately are embedded in that budget or not? Yes, <laughs> Great yes, question. that's- and They are. So even though they haven't okay. been approved, the debt service is in the budget. Yes, and before Carolyn. you answer, Bill, I, I just want to just check, um, Carol, is there anything else that you want to um, add or say? Uh, or I have a, uh, sorry, I, I, the other question is another. I, I, I saw that you were uh, proposing to spend $100,000 to um, implement um, net zero. Is that for the um, energy coordinator, assistant, whatever position that has been talked about recently, or is that for something else? And if it is, where is it in the org chart? I couldn't see it. <laughs> great, great questions. Any and anything else, Carol? That's those are great. That's questions. it. Those are my okay. Good questions. Thank okay. you. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Bill. Go ahead. Okay, so on the debt service question, Carol, the debt service for the first year payments that would occur during the next year are included in the budget. Uh, we all, you know, we have to do that um, rather than raise the, the tax rate even more, you know, because okay. of the bonds. Oh, got um, it. And obviously, future years, the, the, the tax, the, the, um, the amount goes up and those will be in the future budgets, but, uh, but it is included now. So if the bonds pass, nothing would change in the budget for this coming year. Um, to your second question, I believe that is correct. Um, the, the plan is to look at an energy coordinator. That came up very late in, not late, that came up during the budget process. And so had not been part of the original plan. So you're right, it's not on an org chart anywhere. That position isn't fully fleshed out yet. But the idea was to allocate $100,000 to provide staff support to uh, put in the net zero, to implement the net zero plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Um, all right, and uh, Mandy Perkins, go ahead. Hi, I, um, I'm Mandy, obviously. Um, this is kind of my first time uh, listening to the town meeting and I've, I've lived here for four and a half years. And my main question is about the budget for like roads and bridges. Is it enough? Because the first thing we noticed when we moved here, we came from New Hampshire, is like the roads in Montpelier are absolutely atrocious. And I kind of laughed something about, I think when Bill said like the, can't think about what did he say something about um like the quality of our roads like maintaining that and i wanted to be like there is no quality to the roads 
I just, what, what has the previous budget been for that? Cause I just, it just doesn't seem like it's enough to maintain the, the roads in Montpelier. Like when I was driving today, I feel like there's no road that I go down that isn't filled with potholes. And then my other comment to that is how much money is invested in just filling those potholes for like temporary fixes, like the amount of energy and time um, and cost because they fill the potholes and then they immediately just break up and that debris is all over the road. So it just seems kind of almost pointless to me until they can actually really fix the road. Like why put the the effort and money into it when it's just such a quick fix that goes away really quickly. Um, thank you, Mandy. Great questions. Um, and anything else that you wanted to ask about or comment on? No, just about okay. Okay. bridges. That's, that's fine. Um, and um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> so um, Mandy, you hit it on the head. We have not been investing enough in the roads. Uh, there's a long story about that. There's, uh, if I can find, I, I, um, there's, we did, a, our DPW did a great presentation for the council in the fall. I, I'd have to find the date um, and it would be worth checking out where they really laid out what the needs are and the, the funding. So what you heard me say was their estimate was that we needed to put in about $750,000 per year, every year to get our get and keep our roads where we need them to be. So there's a thing called pavement condition index and we have set a goal of 70, which is a technical, you don't need to know that, but that's a, that would be a good score for our, 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 our roads. And uh, to, to achieve and maintain this 70 PCI, we need to invest about 750,000. So we have 760,000 in the budget this year. That's the first time we've really hit that amount. And the, so compounding that, you mentioned you moved here about four years ago, uh, not to make excuses, but you are correct, is particularly the last couple of years because of COVID, not only have we not budgeted enough, we've actually had to cut what we did budget. So we've been really bad on the roads the last, last couple of years. So some of what you saw in the budget, in addition to our annual funding, is catching up on some of those prior roads. That said, it has been a long struggle here. Um, New England in general, I'm sure if you're in New Hampshire, you see potholes come. You really do need to fix them because they, uh, because they can actually get worse. If you just leave them open, then they dig even deeper. And of course, damage to, to vehicles. I don't have the number of what it costs, but we do track that. We could probably get that for you as far as the cost of potholes. And um, so, for example, projects like East State Street that we'll be talking about later, you know, that's rebuilding a, a complete road from start to finish, and that will be putting in all the proper base, proper paving, et cetera. So we're well aware of it. We have each road sort of mapped out by condition. Uh, and and I'm, I'm going on longer than you probably wanted me to, but... The other thing is that there is a little bit of strategy involved in this, which is um, knowing when we're also going to be fixing water and sewer lines, because it makes no sense to dig up a road uh, or, excuse me, fix a road, and then three years later, dig it up to put water and sewer lines in. So there's a little bit of coordination there. So sometimes roads will be left in not great condition because we know there's going to be uh, a much major, more major subsurface work coming and we don't want to du duplicate the effort. And lastly, there is a science to roads about, well, you know what, I'm going to leave all that. I'll let you, I'll, I'll see if I can find the date of that. Uh, I think it was November meeting with DPW and they can explain it a lot better, but uh, it's a great question. It's probably the number one question we get. And one of the reasons I wanted to make a point of emphasizing how much we were spending on infrastructure was so that people knew we were trying to catch up and and get a, at least get to the level we need to be with our roads. So long way to answer, but I hope it helped. Thank you. Um, anyone else um, comments or questions about the budget? I'd like um, to ask. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Mark Billion. Um, it's Mark Billion, Bailey Avenue. I know both the school budget and the city budget are making use of one-time funds, the school budget to zero out the increase. Um, and I assume when you, make, when you make those decisions, you do so considering the next impact on the following year. What does the city budget look like for next year if we were to approve it as it stands? So great, great question. question. Yeah, great sorry. question. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> do you want to take that one? I'm sorry? 
You want to take that one? No, no, no I was going to, okay. I was going to. So we did not use any one-time money to do any uh, ongoing operations um, so that it would not have the impact. If you saw, we were, we had about 2.4 million in one-time money that's all going to restore projects that we had cut due to COVID or put in, um, you know, back equipment or to, to do one-time fixes or improvements uh, for, the, for the reason that you mentioned, so that we don't suddenly have a $2.4 million budget gap next year. So um, we did not use it to offset any budget increases, if that helps. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else? And just giving it another couple of seconds here. Um, and I, um, uh, Didi Brush, I see you've got your hand up again. I just wanted to make sure other folks um, had an opportunity to speak. I don't know if you have a, a further question, but um, uh, any, before you, before I call on you again, um, Didi, any, anyone else um, have a comment or question? Okay, um, uh, so Didi Brush, did you um, have anything further? Oh, you're muted though. Yeah. Excuse me for that. Um, it's okay. I, uh, I think that the figure that Bill just quoted for the road improvements in Montpelier is seems very, very low given the abysmal um, condition of the roads and particularly in recognition of the fact that the East State Street project is demand is is um, budgeted at seven plus million dollars. Now I understand that that requires sewer and water, etc, and a reconstruction which is different than just paving. I understand that. But um, the, um, it, as the previous speaker said, it is unbelievable how um, poor the quality of our roads are, even in comparison to other Northern Vermont roads, which suffer the same frost heave issues, et cetera. So I, I would like to think that the city would put more emphasis on that. Um, I mean, I've, I've been reading on Front Porch Forum the some owners who are facing car repairs because their car went through a pothole or what have you. And I, it's just unacceptable. Um, and I'm not a big infrastructure person, but I do believe that we've sort of gone over the edge as far as the uh, quality of our road maintenance. And I'd like to think that the city would and the council would consider beefing that up and taking away from perhaps something else that's a little bit less urgent. So that's, that's my final comment. Um, thank you for that, Didi. Um, and anyone else? Okay. All right. So um, I think I do. Thank you well. for uh, thank you for all those comments and questions. Those are um, great. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Bill, to talk about the bonds. Uh, oh, um, yeah. I guess I should close the public hearing. I'm going to close the public hearing on the city budget. Um, I'm going to open it on the bonds. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Well, let me see if I can figure out how to get back to where I was. Right. Um, I think I can. Hold on, I'm getting there. Yeah. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes. Great. So, um, 
city, in addition to the budget that the, the council is proposing, uh, we're also proposing uh, four separate bond issues. One uh, is East State Street, uh, which is referred to. Uh, and I'm going to go through these in more detail. One is a group of infrastructure projects. One is to purchase the former Elks property. And one is to upgrade the uh, water resource recovery facility or the wastewater treatment plant or the sewer treatment plant, however you choose to call it. The official name is the, the WRRF water resource recovery facility. So article 12 on the ballot is $7.2 million for East State Street. Uh, this includes $4 million from the general fund. Again, not to play inside baseball, the general fund is the basic city budget. That's essentially what you pay for in your property taxes with whatever revenues are offset. Um, and then other funds include the water fund, the sewer fund, the parking fund, et cetera, that come from other revenues. So that's your, your um, lightning round of municipal finance. Um, so the 3.2 million of this would come from water and sewer funds. So this, uh, so again, talk about road conditions. This is in addition to the, the funds that are already in the budget. This would be a complete reconstruction of East State Street from Main Street to College Street. So the whole thing, top to bottom. All new water and sewer lines installed underneath. A completely rebuilt road base with surface, roof sidewalks, drainage. Uh, that road has a lot of problems. Uh, it has a combined sewer overflow issue, which uh, again, not to talk uh, in, in jargon, way back when cities uh, put all their sewers into one pipe. So whether it was a sanitary sewer from your, your toilet or the, your roof drain, which was you know, stormwater, it all went into one pipe and all flowed into the rivers. And over the years we were uh, ordered and have separated many of them, most of them, so that the storm water goes one place and the sanitary sewers we call it goes to the wastewater plant. Um, there are a handful of these left, which of course none of us like, and we are, uh, they're expensive to fix, but we are, are knocking them off. So this would address one of them uh, as part of this project to, uh, and this is a, actually a particularly big one. So this will help a lot uh, in, with our CSO issue. Uh, there also the parking lot behind the fire station would be improved. Uh, and then there has been a periodic odor problem caused by some sewer backup at East State and Maine that will be corrected. And in addition, uh, this project is funded by another $1.4 million in ARPA on top of the ARPA money that we've already talked about. So pretty major infrastructure. Uh, Mayor, do you want me to go bond by bond or do all the bonds? Let's do all the bonds um, since they were advertised sort of all together. And okay. um, yeah, and we'll take comments okay. on all of them. Or questions. So as I said, that's that's it. It's been long. This has been a, a project long in planning and uh, highly necessary. We'll solve a lot of uh, major issues. Uh, we'll take probably three years to complete in uh, various stages. I think we're going to be doing the CSO and the odor and a few of those things first, uh, then the water and sewer lines the second year, and then the re road reconstruction the third year is the last I heard. Okay, so then Article 13 is 1.815 uh, for miscellaneous infrastructure. Um, this is from the general fund. So it includes $600,000 for Confluence Park. Uh, that's about half of the cost of this project. Uh, the River Confluence Park is located near the confluence of the Winooski and the North Branch River. If you are at the transit center and walking toward downtown right to the right, there's sort of an open park, uh, Piece, you know, it's just grassy area that will be converted to a park. We'll have access to the river, uh, some seating area. And um, again, that was part of the original plan for the transit centers. So if you go back to the, the source documents from 2000, 2002, uh, this was all part of that project. And so this would be completing that aspect of it. The next uh, part of this is $550,000 for the Main Street and Berry Street intersection. We all know that's a terrible intersection. This will put in um, signals. We'll also provide some uh, improved geometrics. Uh, I'm getting in over my head, but there'll be some physical improvements to the intersection and the, uh, the, the new street lights. The street lights will be synced with the lights at State and Main and at Route 2 and Main, so that uh, they're what we call smart technology to help keep traffic flow uh, moving as best as it can. Also be converting the downtown street lighting, which is starting to fail to LED lighting. 
Uh, this is also a, an energy saving. It will include, it shouldn't, shouldn't increase the amount of light, but it should make it more reliable. We've had a lot of problems with our current lighting. Um, so we should have more reliable, steady lighting, and it will be at a drastically uh, reduced energy cost. I think we figured it's about a 12. I'm going to guess 12, but it might be more. I, someone may, if someone on my staff knows the answer to the payback for this, please let me know before I finish this presentation. Uh, and then we mentioned the, the pellet heating system at the DPW garage. Fairpoint made earlier about the emissions. I don't have the answer for that right now. What we do have is um, a, an adopted plan for net zero with three major projects for city buildings. Uh, and then the next uh, part would be converting city fleet. And then of course the last part is getting, well, then there's a whole bunch for the schools, which we have no say over and then convert, then uh, dealing with private citizens to try to make the change. But this is the first of the three major city projects that was recommended. And then lastly, we have, a, uh, lastly, but certainly not leastly, I should say, it's just the least expensive. We do have a slope failure on Barvin Street, which is putting the road in danger. Uh, and this would um, stabilize that and rebuild that road so that it can operate safely. So those together are um, one, one bond project, and that is Article 13. Article 14 uh, is the $2 million for the purchase of the former Elks uh, project. And it is coming from the general fund. Uh, that is not the full purchase price, has been fully developed. We expect it to be closer to $3 million. Uh, appraisal should be coming in very shortly now. Um, and any difference would be supplemented by a recreation reserve, which has been set aside for a new facility. So. Um, again, trying to answer some of the questions that have come up, it would purchase the entire current Elks Club property and the buildings. It may be done in conjunction with private investment, a nonprofit group called The Hub. And I've noticed um, there are a couple of folks from The Hub on the call right now. So perhaps they'll want to weigh in on this at some point. Uh, the parcel size is large. It's close to 140 acres, includes, uh, obviously it was a former golf course includes room for housing, community facilities, parking, trails, fields, and more. Uh, we see it as a large opportunity to meet a lot of city needs. Housing is clearly a top priority in the city, and this is a chance for the city to guide some housing development. Uh, we'll require more money in the future uh, for a new community center. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, and just as a point of reference, the uh, Recreation on, uh, Center on Bear Street has very significant problems. We've studied that a lot. To renovate that to a, a kind of minimal use was going to cost six plus million. Uh, as I said before, I do have a more detailed presentation available if desired. I also, a um, couple of people I know I've seen in the discussion talking about the price of real estate. I just did a little bit of, of look in terms of what this might mean in terms of property in the city. And uh, in the last three years, there have been 49 uh, single unit, single family home properties that have sold for $400,000 or more. And the first six, the, excuse me, the first five, the highest five together total 3.2 million. So five single family homes um, have sold for the amount of this entire parcel. Um, and so in terms of the city owning land and potentially selling some off, it seems like we, uh, while we don't want to get in the speculation business, we think there are some opportunities here. As I said, I have a little bit more information on that if, if desired. Uh, lastly, uh, phase two, $16.4 million for the wastewater uh, water resource recovery facility upgrade. This comes from the sewer fund paid for by sewer rates. It is phase two of the plant overhaul project. Uh, phase one modernized the plant uh, and uh, it, you know, it's hard to it's hard to simplify all of these things in these short bullet points. Uh, it completely overhauled a lot of the electrical use, uh, made some very huge uh, uh, upgrades, and modernized the plant to accept um, process commercial organic food waste. It also resulted in increased methane production, which we we're using to heat that building. Uh, it's important to note that that uh, that bond was nineteen million dollars. Uh, although I think we didn't, we probably ended up, I think, letting about 15 million of it. Um, but it didn't change the rates because of the reduction in 
operating costs and the revenues coming from food waste. So I think that's just an important note that we didn't, the $19 million did not jack up people's sewer rates. Uh, it, was, it was sort of offset on an annual basis. So now, and, and that is the goal for this one as well, as much as possible. So the methane um, that we have will be used to dry the residuals from the plant. This is called sludge or biosolids. This is one of the uh, problems with wastewater treatment in general. Uh, we process everything out. We, we, we send clean water to the rivers, not including, of course, the PFAS, which is a, a relatively newly understood issue that is in all aspects of water treatment, and sewer treatment all over the country, probably the world. Um, but these biosolids or sludge is left over. And, you know, back in the day, this was the sewer, the, the septage that got spread on fields. Uh, many of it has fields, but uh, it has been shown to have uh, things in it that aren't great. So it is now processed uh, some more and we truck it to, we pay to have it trucked to the, the landfill in Coventry. We get a very favorable rate for that um, in part because we then sell the processing of the leachate from Coventry, uh, which is, uh, it is used for, for cover. Um, this project here has assumed that we would no longer continue to get revenue from leachate. We may, that is a decision yet to be made, but we've, we've taken the conservative assumption and assumed that we were gonna be paying a higher cost to distribute sludge. Therefore, this drying process will drastically reduce the volume of the sludge uh, or the biosolids so that our cost per ton will go down quite a bit and we will also reduce our trucking costs. So again, offsetting our operations uh, and making it more environmentally sound um, does not solve the PFAS problem. It will, however, in, in address the increased odor uh, and it will complete the plant upgrade. So while we upgraded a lot of the plant in phase one, this will complete the plant. I got asked a really good question. Why are we upgrading a 40 year old plant? Um, you know, sort of, aren't we throwing bad money after good? And the answer is actually when this is completed, we'll have a new plant. Uh, it will just have been upgraded in place and will be set now for the next long term. But we do have, uh, for anyone who's been down near the plant, particularly in the summertime, knows there's an odor problem. We are under an action problem and it does need to be addressed. So that is, um, as quickly as I can explain, a very complicated pro project. And I hope there are folks here that can explain more if we get uh, more questions. So um, I'm actually now back to the budget. I'll just wrap this up, Mayor, and then we'll take all kinds of questions because there's only a couple more slides. Sure. sure. Uh, should have organized this better. Uh, so going quickly, in addition to the city's budget and the four bonds, uh, there are three independent ballot items which the council allowed to be put on the ballot because rather than asking people to petition during COVID. So the Kellogg Hubbard Library, uh, request, the annual request is up by $45,000. That is included when we talk about the tax impact of our budget. Public Safety Authority uh, is also up for 14,000. Uh, it was zero last year. So again, that's combined, that is $59,000 added to the city's uh, tax rate that are, are non-city items. And then the Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice items were the same as last year. So those are three independent budget items. So this all adds up to the municipal portion of the tax rate uh, is uh, about 8.1 cents or 6.8%. As we go back to the beginning slide, the goal was to keep within the 7% inflation rate and it just barely does that. And again, that includes those ballot items as well uh, that we just talked about. The resident uh, the education tax for resident is actually going to drop by 2.7%, 4.7 cents, making the overall residential tax rate this year only going up by 3.3 cents or 1.1%. Uh, so important to note, that's the lowest percentage change in overall property tax rate since 2016 and then 2011 before that, and a five-year average of 2.7%. So uh, no question, the city's budget has a lot of challenges this year as we try to come back. But fortunately, uh, it's kind of the reverse of where we've been in prior years when the education tax had some big bumps and the city held theirs down. Um, so last slide is saying, reminding everyone that voting is uh, actually already started. 
but your last chance is seven to seven on next Tuesday, March 1st. And the early voting, like I said, is underway. So vote early, do not vote often. And um, that is it. And I think we're happy to take any questions about uh, the bonds, tax rate, even if they want to, well, I'll leave that's that to Amanda if they want to talk about anything else. So That's fine, that's fine. Um, great, and uh, so thank you, Bill. And so, um, yeah, we're gonna now be open up um, for questions or comments about the bonds, or if you have something residual about the city budget, that's fine as well. Um, so, and again, if you uh, would say your name, where you live, and um, try to keep your comments two minutes if you can. I have a feeling probably a lot of folks may want to make comments. Actually, I'm just now remembering that something that I wanted to say, um, which is that Bill, you said you had more information about the Elks um club bond and uh just from checking in with counselors um who would appreciate seeing that extra presentation now yeah okay there's a couple i have a feeling that that may be one of the reasons why a lot of folks are here um so actually before we go into public comments. I apologize. Thank you, um, Mandy Perkins, for being ready to raise your hand. I appreciate that. Um, but uh, let's let's uh, hear the um, the Elks, Cl Elks Club bond presentation sort of extension. And, um, and we'll go to comments after that. Okay, um, go ahead, Bill. Thanks. Uh, can I share my screen? Okay, yes. Yes. For a second there, it was disabled, but we got it. Um, okay, so this is really, uh, I probably talked about a lot of this, but it was really just an attempt to dig a little bit deeper into this. This does certainly seem to be the topic of discussion this year, uh, trying to try to answer as many questions. Um, so this is, uh, the, the purchase would be for 203 uh, Country Club Road, not County Club, sorry, my bad. Uh, we putting 2 million of tax dollars in on, for a bond over 20 years, average payment of about $120,000 per year, high of about 145 and the low of about 101 in 20 years. It's a declining uh, payment. So it would support the long-term repayment for the purchase of all, the, all of the property and all of the buildings. Uh, it's currently under a private appraisal right now. We have presented a purchase and sales agreement to the owner. I um, have not heard, uh, like I said, I'm away this week, so I haven't heard back whether that has been accepted, um, but we have certainly been talking uh, very openly with them about terms. Um, so we are looking at So there's been a lot of questions and I'm gonna start right off by saying that this is definitely not the typical um, municipal project in that we come in with a very specific project and say, um, here's, here's what it is, here's what we're gonna do, here's where we're gonna do it, here's exactly what it's gonna cost and what it's gonna look like. Uh, this is, I think, an opportunity that presents itself and the city is um, looking forward looking. So for people who are uncomfortable with that, I, I do understand that. And that may be a reason why they don't want to support this. I get that. On the other hand, we, as we've talked a lot about the, the, the strategic plan at the beginning, which clearly called for housing, really called for you know, outside recreation and quality of life. And we, I think the council staff felt that this really uh, looked at this. One of the biggest delays, and I'll probably talk about this more later on in this, but just right off the top, uh, one of the biggest delays we have in projects, and uh, you know, many people have referenced how long it took to, to do the transit center project, and it's, it surely did. Uh, many years of that had to do with environmental remediation, but many other years had to do with uh, negotiating and securing ownership of that property and related real estate. Um, once you've identified a specific project on a specific piece of land, the landowner has a lot of leverage uh, because you can't really move your transit center somewhere else. Uh, so it can become difficult and it can become expensive. In, uh, I think one of the things we felt was um, 
if the city owns the land, first of all, it's an asset that can be resold. Second of all, it gives us the opportunity to master plan projects. So we view it, and I, when I say we, I'm talking about the city council and city staff as a group, not any one person. I'm speaking as, as the agent of the council. We see a, a chance to have a community master planning process that would look at uh, housing opportunities, affordable and market rate, a new community center to address our rec options, childcare options, perhaps uh, opportunities for the senior center. There's land for rec fields, parks and, and trails, perhaps a dog park, more conserved land. There's a lot of opportunity, it's a big space. It does have water and sewer, by the way. So we would seek for other funds to support this project. And again, we embark on a robust uh, public planning process. Um, we can talk about that if people would like, although we, because, the council hasn't made a decision about how to proceed with that. It's all would just be uh, possible. So what are some of the questions that have come up? Um, how will the city be funding this? Um, as I said, we have the funds identified to support the bond to purchase the land, uh, assuming the bond passed. Uh, for the future, we would be looking for grant opportunities to pay for the feasibility studies of different aspects of this, as well as seeking grants for some of the different um, aspects of the project. Again, we would be looking to sell parts of the project for private housing. So whether it was lots or parcels or, and future tax revenues from, from private funding. Again, all of this would be planned out and, and brought to owner's attention, uh, excuse me, the community's attention uh, prior to anything further steps being taken. Uh, why is there a sense of urgency to purchase the land? Well, like I just mentioned, the biggest holdup is always land acquisition. Property values are increasing uh, quickly and properties of this size do not become often become available. We've heard a lot about uh, the need for housing and you know, the city doing something about housing. We agree. The problem is most of this is on private property. So we can encourage people, we can create zoning, we can do lots of things, uh, but you can't control what somebody does or if they do it or how they choose to proceed. If the city owns it, uh, we have a way to uh, sort of get in and involve and maybe influence the market. So, excuse me. Let's, so we can direct the type of housing. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles to uh, creating housing is purchasing land. If the city can work with someone to create more affordable housing, perhaps we underwrite the cost of the land so that we can create housing that more people can live in. Uh, if you look at the economics of housing um, in Vermont in general, with exception of Chittenden County, and certainly in central Vermont, really it only, you can only support very high-end housing or truly subsidized affordable housing and really not much in between. You hear often, where's the home that a firefighter can live or a teacher or a police officer? And you know, it's not there. They're not being built in the market because they don't work financially. So if the city really wants to develop a wider range of housing, basically we need to bring our own resources to the table. And some of that is equalizing the cost of land acquisition. We can't make private owners um, do things that they don't wanna do or that are not financially feasible for them. Uh, what about consideration for seniors? Um, we certainly have got feedback about how we would, could include uh, senior uh, programming into a community center, accessible buildings, uh, perhaps an indoor walking track, pickleball, indoor meeting rooms. Again, these are all possibilities. There is a lot more parking available at this site than there is at the current senior center on Barry Street. Walkability. So it's true that this site is not necessarily walkable for, from downtown like the current rec site is. We do have a pool and a rec site about $1.4 million, my, $1.4 million, okay, I've been talking too much. 1.4 miles from the state and main intersection. This is uh, almost a full mile longer from the state and main intersection. It is along the bike path. Uh, we would certainly be looking at extending the bike path, you know, uh, have a connector from the bike path up to this property. And, you know, our observation is that most of the participants in the current rec facility actually do use vehicles. Uh, young kids get dropped off for practices and events. They get picked up afterwards. Other people drive. Uh, so while it might be handy for people to walk, it isn't necessarily the current reality. Uh, and for people in some parts of the town, it's not that walkable, so they're driving anyway. We don't like to uh, promote vehicle use, but really given the layout of our community until there's much more um, mass transit, 
uh, someone's going to be driving if you're coming from the Terrace Street end of town, or if you're coming from the Town Hill section or over across the river off of Northfield Street, you're going to be driving to our rec center, you're going to be driving to some facility. What about building the rec center next to the pool? We have looked at that. Um, and it also has site restrictions. There's a lot of facilities that already exist there. And so we wouldn't really be able to develop anything new uh, in addition to what's already there. Parking is already a nightmare at that site. Uh, anyone who's gone to the pool in the summer, uh, particularly on the night of a Mountaineers game, knows that uh, it's a free for all. And adding, uh, well, first of all, some of the parking would be taken away by this building. And second of all, it would be creating more demand. Uh, so it would certainly be something we would need to manage. Uh, much better than is being managed now. And the cost of renovating the 55 Berry Street, again, we have to get the ability of the facility ADA accessible. We have to get rid of the asbestos. We have to change all the HVAC systems. We have to make it so that all the floors are, are functional. It's anywhere from six to eight million, depending on what we want to include in that. Again, it has, comes with no additional parking and no expansion needs. So while we could do a lot of things there, I, we certainly wouldn't be expanding our offerings as much as we would like. So in summary, um, uh, as I said at the beginning, we're looking prospectively at an opportunity, uh, remind people that you know, there are many existing neighborhoods that were once similar opportunities that were open land and somebody made a, a, a chance. You know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, there was a model that worked financially at the time where a developer purchased a bunch of land, built a subdivision, put in, maybe paid for the infrastructure and then sold the lots off and got their money back. That no longer works. The cost of infrastructure is completely different than what you can get for housing, the price of developing housing. And so we're really looking back to a hundred years ago when cities uh, laid out the roads and built the neighborhoods, the meadow, other, you know, the neighborhoods closer to town were all laid out by the city of Montpelier. Uh, and then people developed them, developed the housing lots on their own. And that really is where I think Vermont is and New England is right now. So it's true, there's no pro a specific project proposal. There is a concept and there certainly would be uh, a uh, planning process going forward. And finally, the property is a real estate asset. If we truly decide that we just don't wanna do anything on it, uh, we can sell it. Uh, so I think that's really just digging a little bit deeper, trying to address specifically questions that have been raised. I don't know if it really provides any more enlightenment to people, but I think it's a, it's a summary of um, the city's thinking on this to date. That's, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, appreciate that. So again, if folks have comments or questions, um, thoughts they wanna share uh, on any of the bonds or the city budget, now is the time. Um, and again, if you'd say your name and where you live and um, uh, anticipating that there may be a number of folks who may wanna comment, so try to keep them your comments short, two minutes ideally if you can. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that is it. Okay, uh, Mandy Perkins, go ahead. Uh, so I live on Wheelock Street and my question is about Article 13. And first, I just wanna make sure, um, clarifying question, Confluence Park, that's behind Shaw's, correct? Yes. Um, I'm just across, across the river, behind Shaw's and across the river. Right, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just wanna know why that's part of like the mis miscellaneous infrastructure. Like, I don't think with all, I don't think, so we would have to pay 600,000 towards that and then it's gonna be matched. I don't understand why we're putting any money towards that. When my observation around town is we don't even maintain the parks very well that we have. The, um, the bike path is very rarely maintained where weeds are overgrowing. The same with um, sidewalks that are not right in town. Uh, like when I walk down um, uh, River Street, like coming off of Wheelock Street, there's this part where uh, the, the wall goes up pretty high and that is always like overgrown coming down into you know where you're walking. So I don't understand why we'd be putting money into like building a new park when we... <laughs> It seems like we need more money towards like maintenance of Montpelier in general. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that's in Article 13 because I, 
everything else made sense except for that one part. I just think that's a lot of money. Yeah, thank you. Um, your point is well taken there. Um, any Anything else that folks want to say about that? Okay, um, thank you um, uh, for that, um, Mandy. Uh, Diane Derby, go ahead. Hi there. I um, guess I'll start my video here. Thanks so much for the presentation and thanks for hearing us out. I, uh, um, I'll try to keep to one minute on the country club property and one minute on water treatment. I think um, it would have been a lot easier for some of us to um, maybe get on board if we felt we had heard all of the details of the purchase and sale agreement. I, I think we don't feel like we've heard all the details. And part of that might be because you went into executive session to discuss it. And I think that's a real mistake to, to go into executive session to discuss real estate purchases where the city uh, taxpayers are paying for the purchase price. So I'll just say that much. I, I, I find that disappointing. And I also think, you know, to compare it to the rec center on Berry Street, we, we agreed years ago that that was not a, a solution, that that was not an option. We all know and have known for years. And the fact that we haven't moved forward on what to do with that property on Berry Street after all these years, it's just sat there for, I used to play basketball 25 years ago at that property, and it's just been uh, in the same kind of condition for that long. So um, I, I don't know, Bill, if you can speak to what the terms of the purchase and sale agreement are, but we know that Steve Robolini bought that property in 2016. I think it was a $1.2 million purchase. So we're hearing $3 million now to purchase it. So just to hear the city thinking on why the price has gone up so much on that property in five years time would be helpful. Um, and maybe those facts aren't accurate. So maybe you can help me out there if they're not. On the water treatment plant, I think, you know, Bill and I have been back and forth a bit on this. I, I never heard any talk of a phase one and phase two where it's, phase two would include another $16 million ask. And part of phase one was increasing capacity. And, you know, as many of you already know, we're the only town or city left standing that's still accepting the leachate from Casella. And I find that really concerning. And, and it's not because it's not a NIMBY factor. It's that we're dumping the, the PFA contaminants into the river. And I just, you know, we've dumped raw sewage into the river for years. And now we're dumping Casella's leachate that can't be properly treated. And that's not an issue for Montpelier to figure out. That has been an issue for Casella and the state and the EPA to figure out for years. And Bill and I went back and forth on this and Bill said, well, where would you send the leachate? And that's not for us to decide. And I really hope that if we make another really considerable investment in this wastewater treatment plant, it's not to increase our capacity so we can take you know, untreated effluent and leachate um, I just think that's putting a lot on the people of Montpelier. And I'm a user of, of Lake Champlain. I swim, I sail, I kayak, and we have spent millions and millions in federal dollars to clean up Lake Champlain. And we've seen what happened in Lake Memphremagog from the leachate from the Coventry plant. And that they're looking for a crisis designation for Lake Memphremagog, which was pristine, pristine Lake so I just, you can hear the frustration in my voice. I just don't, I'd love to hear an explanation right now about how it was decided that Montpelier would be the one to accept all of the leachate after all of the communities agreed to stop. And, and why is it up to us? Thanks. Great questions, Diane. Um, thank you so much um, for those questions. Um, Bill, do you want to um, address any of those questions? Sure. Go ahead. Yep. Um, I think I got them in order. Uh, so first, regarding executive session, um, the reason we went into executive session was to discuss the negotiation of a purchase and sale. Um, 
you know, what might we accept, what might not, you know, uh, so to do it in public would be tipping the hand to the person you're negotiating with. Uh, that's a pretty common practice. Obviously, you can't make any binding agreements without, without being in public. That said, the, uh, and we uh, I have confirmed that we are still in uh, agreement stage, not signed agreement stage, but the proposal would be up to 3 million, which is the asking point part of the process, subject to uh, the appraised appraisal, so it could be reduced based on appraisal, and um, subject, of course, to bond passing. Uh, those are really the, the basics. Uh, there's nothing else to add to that, really, as far as the basics of the agreement. Um, we believe, based on recent sales, that that is that the high twos is the value for the property. Uh, he did buy it at 1.3 million in 2016, but as we've mentioned, our property sales have really sailed. And we have seen uh, even at Sabin's half that property per re purchased recently uh, for $650,000. Um, so that was the basis for that. Uh, with regard to the wastewater plant, so uh, again, I'll try not to repeat what we, <laughs> all that we, we said to one another day in, but uh, in general, the city started accepting leachate in the 90s and was not the only uh, people accepting leachate. PFAS was not something that anybody knew about at that time. You know, it did make sense financially for the city to accept the leachate. Um, also, because we got favorable terms on disposing our biosolids, which is another product that we all contribute to. Uh, over time, uh, correctly, we are the last one to accept leachate. And in the, over the last four years, when PFAS became a much more known topic, uh, the city councils raised it pretty aggressively. We called in the uh, state and Casella to a meeting in the fall, uh, asking them what their plans were, expressing our displeasure at this, and asking them where it was likely to go. And the most likely alternative location was Plattsburgh, which still empties out into Lake Champlain. So in terms of, uh, in terms of protecting the plant, the, the lake uh, it didn't seem to make that much difference. The city council put a one-year deadline and said um, to the state, figure it out. We, we're gonna consider not taking the leachate after a year if you don't have, if you're not substantially down the road. And so, as I said, uh, to your question of, have we, are we building a plant so that we could take more leachate the answer is no, uh, that is not, I mean, what we can take is what we can take, uh, but the assumption in all the financial modeling is that we will not be taking leachate. Um, thank you. Um, and I, I just wanna add to that, um, I, I just, um, uh, in terms of the, the PFAS question in, in the leachate, uh, Diane, I, I really uh, appreciate that part of your question because that was a, a topic that the council really wrestled with, and it was a not an easy decision um, at all to um, to continue to take it. Uh, we were weighing, uh, you know, do we just get out and um, and say this is like we want no part of this, uh, and and kind of as you say, you know, like let somebody else figure it out, um, and we don't have to be the ones to. Um, you know, make sure that it gets better. Uh, but it sounded like there were some remediation methods that uh, Casella would be exploring um, and with state oversight. And basically if this, if no Vermont plant was taking um, leachate, then the oversight from um, the Agency of Natural Resources would would go away because there was, there would be no one in, in Vermont taking it. Um, so, you know, in a sense, this was kind of a, a compromise to um, to both recognize that uh, it needs to be dealt with, remediation needs to happen, um, and so we wanted to hold Casella's feet to the fire um, to say you need to make improvements, um, which might not have happened if it was being shipped to Plattsburgh, uh, and. Uh, and, and so, uh, but as you know, the, the other side of it would, would be to say that like, you've got a year to uh, demonstrate substantial um, improvement. And if that doesn't happen, then, um, then I think, I mean, I, I can't obligate a future council, but um, I think we very well may walk away from um, taking leachate. So thank you for that. And that, uh, 
that was there was more conversation uh, about this at that meeting. Um, we actually had multiple meetings um, about this. We had one with um, the Agency of Natural Resources and then another one um, with Casella um, later on. And uh, I'm sh I have no doubt that this is something that we will continue to talk about. So um, any other counselor um, want to address that? Um, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I would just encourage Diane, I don't want to get into the semantics and take too much time, but Diane, I'd really encourage you to go back to the meetings that we had in the fall and review the um, uh, what the council passed in terms of the deadline and the timeline we we were allowing for yeah. um, Casella to work on their pilot project. So you understand that there is a real deadline. It would have to be a change of direction by the council. So I just wanted to make sure you are you know aware of of what those you know, next steps would look like. So I'm glad that you did. That's great. Thank you. Thank I, you. I did, Jay, but okay. back to my original concern is that um, it's really not up to the Montpelier City Council to be telling Casella to deal with a statewide issue. It's up to ANR and maybe EPA. And that's that's well, really my concern is yep. that we we have taken this role on as Montpelier's problem and it's the state's problem. And if I can- Yep, so um, if you could, because uh, uh, usually we, we keep our comments just to like one um, one time, but go, go ahead, finish your thought and- Well, and, we'll and just to my question about the second $16 million bonding, I never saw anything in the first 16 million bonding that suggested we'd need to be coming back again for another 16 million. So was that always the plan? And if so, why wasn't it made clear in 2018 when we bonded? Okay, um, thank you. Um, and any anything further you wanna say? I can't say? answer that. Okay, I can, go ahead. I can try to answer that as best I can. Um, you're correct. Uh, initially the plan was to try to do power conversion and, and energy conversion and it was, so we had a process of studying the alternatives and um, it proved, that proved not really to be feasible as it turned out. We thought it was gonna be probably in the $5 million range. They were, council got several updates over the course of the year and in the end of the day, the, the plan that is being presented uh, is the, was the, the recommendation um, with offsetting costs. So um, yes, the capital outlay is higher, but so are the savings. Um, so you're right that certainly it was not going to be a $16 million phase two. That was an, that evolved over the last year through a series of updates to the city council. Okay. Thank you. Um, Joe Castellano, uh, see so you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Bill. And thank you everybody, um, for the wonderful presentation. I just had one question. This is related to the Elks Club purchase. Um, I mean, I was just doing some rough math and the price paid is 150% appreciation over the last six years, which translates to 25% a year. I mean, I've been a real estate appraiser for quite a long time. I don't think I've seen that level of appreciation outside of San Francisco in quite a while. So I'm just kind of curious on why I, I'd love to see the appraisal and see if he can justify a 25% increase per year. Cause that's just, to me, seems kind of uh, excessive. Fair enough. We, we're waiting to see the appraisal too. Um, you know, our, the, the appraisal and the city has to look at the value of it today, what, what it was purchased at before and why it appreciated. I mean, those are interesting questions, but if we can't, part, you know, we're not going to get it for $1.3 million today. We know that. So I, I, it's a fair question and I'm looking forward to the analysis as well, but we have seen some pretty high appreciation here, particularly in open land. Yeah. I, ju I would just be curious now, will the appraisal be available to the public or is and that actually, kind of um, so before we keep going, so Joe, is there anything else you want to ask? Cause we're, the goal is to keep all of your questions sort of together. Okay. Th that's it. Yeah. Okay, all right, sorry, go ahead, Bill. The answer is yes, it will be. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, okay, um, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Joe Castellano, look around the corner from your house in our, in our, in our College Street neighborhood. Appreciation over the last five years of property has been in that ballpark. 
There's a house on on a house on on uh, uh, Fuller, not Fuller, um, around the corner. I forget the name of the street. It sold for over four hundred thousand dollars. It was a just a a house that they probably bought for ninety thousand dollars. That this is what's happening in the city. This is a problem, but it is what's happening in the city. I think you're off base. Thank you, Peter. Um, and um, thank you, Joe Castellano, for raising your hand again. I'm going to hold off for a second. I know you want to respond, um, but I want to check it to see if there's anybody else who hasn't spoken yet who would like to comment. I would like to speak. Um, Kathleen Perot. Um, yes, well, I'm not Kathleen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm uh, sorry. I guess the wrong. Um, um, no, I am Billy Perot. Oh, so okay. Go ahead, Billy. Yes. It would be very possible for the city to have a second appraisal done of the property and then to have a third appraiser review the two and make a determination about what that person feels is the fair market value. That happens all the time. I appraised commercial real estate in Vermont for 14 years, so I know that happened. $600,000 for the Confluence Park, a sliver of land that is maybe the size of my lot here. I cannot support that. Would someone please tell me what the energy coordinator who's gonna get paid well, it's $100,000 total. I assume that's salary and over, overhead. What is that person going to do every day, every year to earn that money? Because I would like to apply for that job. It sounds like easy money to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill, do you want to take those questions? I said, I'll, I mean, good point. You're right. I've heard of that with the appraisals. Um, if typically what we would do is have our own assessor look at it once we get it, who is also qualified fee appraiser and see if they thought there was a reason for doing that. But good point, Bill. Um, I don't know if anyone from the council wants to talk about the Confluence Park or the energy coordinator. Uh, I mean, the Confluence Park, it includes the construction, but there may be others that are better able to speak to it than I am. Um, Jay, do you want to speak to that? Well, no, I just, it, it sounded like the question was about the purchase of the land when in reality it's the actual building of the park, which is what that cost ties into. That's all. I just hope that clarifies things. Okay. Um, and as far as the um, energy coordinator goes, um, there um, have been a, identified a, quite a long list of things that they could be uh, doing. So for example, managing the district heat plant, um, they could be um, managing the um, home energy information ordinance uh, that's gonna be taking effect in July. Um, they, uh, so the city currently has a um, internal uh, green revolving loan fund that uh, helps make energy uh, improvement projects within the city. Um, they could be um, identifying and managing those projects. Um, we also have a um, net zero energy roadmap for the city that has identified um, projects to be completed. And so um, that person could be managing um, the completion um, of those projects. Uh, there are a number of other things that um, were on the list. Those are just a few. Um, and happy to talk more with you about that if um, if you are interested. Um, that um, and, and anyone else want to uh, comment on any of, uh, from council? Anyone from council want to comment on any of, of those um, pieces? Okay, um, thank you. Um, all right, uh, Carol Welch, go ahead. Um, hi, and I didn't say before, but I live on Valerie Avenue. Not that it matters for my question. Um, I, I, when we're talking about this, is about the um, the Elks Club purchase and. Uh, I, you said the bond is for like two million, um, but then there is going to be some um, money that's currently being held in reserve for the, the a new recreation center or, you know, an improvement or whatever, and then some other um, reserve funds. And I just like to understand a little better, like how much and where are those other funds coming from. So sorry if I was confusing, Carol. 
the the purchase of the Elks Club is only coming from two sources: the bond and a reserve fund for recreation. Uh, the, the, I think I was talking about we had some reserve for capital improvements we talked about. Okay. And okay. then for future, we would be looking for other funding sources, including potentially selling lots. But for the actual purchase, there's only two sources of funds. Okay. And and the um, and the current recreation reserve money is how much? There's about a million in there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dee Dee Brush, go ahead. Oh, um, actually, before you go, Jack, is this about Carol's question? No, it isn't. I just noticed that it's uh, it's 8.30. Oh, it's 8.30. Uh, okay. Um, what I would uh, propose at this point is that, um, so uh, T.D. Brush, if you would like to um, make your comment or ask questions, um, uh, I'm going to give you that opportunity to do, to do that. And then um, we will, um, as we usually do at 8.30, um, we will take a 10 minute break and uh, certainly want to continue to hear from folks uh, if, um, if there are more comments or questions from people. Uh, so, uh, but we'll, we'll take a 10 minute break and, and then we'll come back to people's comments and, and questions and thoughts. Um, but uh, Dee, Dee Brush, go ahead. Thank you. Um, quick question. Has there been any kind of forward motion on the agreement or, or arrangement between the hub and the city. Should the city purchase this property, what is the arrangement or the relationship between the hub and the city? Does the, uh, and who manages the property? Who, I, I think so many questions are unanswered that I think people really, really are yearning for a more concrete, specific, definitive answer. Um, and was there any any other um, part Not, of? No, no. no. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Go ahead, Bill. Um, so fair enough, Edidi. And um, I wish we could give you a really concrete, definitive answer. And there are representatives of the hub here who may wish to speak. We've had ongoing conversations. What we know is that they have a plan for what they'd like to do. And it may depend, you know, certainly depends on how the ownership of the property pans out as to how they move forward. Uh, and then we've had a lot of talks, but there is no formal agreement yet. We expect to come to them. They've been excellent uh, cooperative conversations with a lot of good ideas. Um, and I wish I, you know, that, that's what, all I can tell you now, but there may, I know there's at least two people from the hub that we're on that are attending virtually that if they want to weigh in, I'm happy to hear from them. Yep, that's fine. Um, if, um, if folks from the hub would like to comment, you may, you don't have to. Uh, oh, okay, um, Ethan, um, I can go ahead. Acton. Hi, uh, my name is Ethan Acton. I live on Clarendon Ave, and I'm the chair of the, the board of the hub. Um, for those of you who are not aware of what the hub is, it's a, uh, we are planning to create a community social and recreation center. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. All of the uh, members of the board are residents mostly from Montpelier, but from all over central Vermont. Um, and uh, we uh, are interested in uh, creating a place for people to uh, come cross-generational, um, but um, with a, a big focus on uh, families. Uh, particularly in um, central Vermont, there really is no place for people to go uh, with their family where they, everyone in the family can find a, an activity they would be interested in. And that's uh, what we're hoping this uh, center will be able to provide. Um, and we've been in uh, um, conversations with the, with the city, but even prior to that, we have been working on this project for over two years. Uh, talking to the present owner 
and uh, talking to the city about it if they were to purchase it. And um, what, one of the wonderful things that, that we see about that particular property, it's 138 acres. Uh, there's only one building on it uh, right now. So uh, it's a, basically a once in a generation opportunity for, uh, for our city uh, to uh, be able to take advantage of this open land that's available to do all kinds of creative things. And we feel that uh, would be an ideal location for our uh, center to be located. Uh, and the synergy that could come out of doing this in collaboration with the city uh, would be great. One of the things I think is important for everyone to understand is that there is um, uh, uh, both the, the, the city and the hub are interested in making sure that all of the facilities that are uh, built up there are accessible to everyone. And that's the sort of thing that we're talking to the city about, how do we make that happen? And so uh, I, I think that it would be great if um, the city is able to buy that property, it would be great for the city, it would be great for our children, it would be great for our grandchildren, it would be great for our great, great grandchildren, very much like uh, some of the other legacies that are, are existing here now and uh, will be a great asset to the city of Montpelier, will attract businesses, will attract residents, will attract young families. Uh, we are all talk about how we're aging out. Uh, how, do we, how do we attract younger families to come into a community? Well, we, we provide them with facilities, we provide them with housing. So uh, it is the the feeling of, of all the board members uh, that um, the first step is for the city to uh, get access to this property. And the way they do that, number one, is to pass the uh, Article 14, the bond. So uh, I think that's the main thing. There's a lot of details to be worked out, but we've talked about a lot of them. And we think we have a, a very uh, mutually agreeable understanding of uh, how things would work. but. Um, we, we don't have any formal agreement in place, uh, but we, we feel uh, very good about uh, how this could help both the city as well as our, uh, our effort to bring in a facility that um, will be a great, access to, uh, great asset to the city of Montpelier. Thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Didi, for that question. Okay, uh, all right, so it is 8.37 right now. Um, we are gonna take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 8.47 uh, and, uh, and we'll jump back into uh, people's questions and comments. And um, uh, Joe Castellano, I've not, I've not forgotten that you might wanna <laughs> circle back. Uh, so, okay, uh, we'll see you all uh, in about 10 minutes, okay. Okay, it seems like people are starting to come back, which is great. It is 8.48 and um, Lisa Moody, I, I see your hand there, but I'm gonna to go to um, our assistant city manager first. Um, Cameron Niedermeyer, go ahead, what do you, what's up? Hi, oh, I just raised my hand on behalf of, I do believe Stephen Whitaker has been trying to speak, um, uh, oh. but he's as a phone number, so it's hard for him to, raise his hand. So I just wanted uh, to make sure he was in the queue. Okay, thank you. So we'll go um, Lisa Moody and then we'll go to um, Steve Whitaker. All right, uh, Lisa Moody, go ahead. Good evening. Um, I live up on Gallison Hill. I've been here for almost 38 years. And my question is about the Elks Club. Um, what is the, uh, do we have a study or any information as to how much of the property is suitable for building? That's a big piece of property, but I know there's a lot of ledge in the area. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I have concerns about environmental concerns as well, about the wildlife and, you know, that the impact um, and uh, development would have on the property. 
It's a great question. And I just want to check before um, you answer that, Bill. Um, uh, Lisa, do you have any other questions that you want to, uh, or comments you want to make uh, as a part of, um, as a part of this? I guess just or that what would be the expense to do that? So if we don't have a study, should we do a study? And what would that entail as far as financial goes? Great, thank you. Great question. Um, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, so thanks, Lisa. The answer is no, we don't have a study. Um, obviously, anytime there's development, you have to be cautious of wildlife, um, particularly in you know areas where it has been wild. Uh, some of that property is in current use. That would be one of the first things we would do. And uh, you mentioned, you know, there are what planning grants for feasibility studies for those kind of things. So we would uh, obviously, uh, before we could proceed, anything else is to get a better understanding of where things could go and what, you know, fortunately there's enough need that we think we could, we can work around it, but it's number one in our minds too. So good question. Okay. Um, it just seems like cart before the horse to me. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, Steve Whitaker, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Steve Whitaker here. Um, I think this is a case study in lack of due diligence. Um, I will try to be measured in my comments. Um, I, I believe management, city manager is aware that there's access problems. Uh, this may be a landlocked piece. We need to question why Steve Rebellini, who is a very competent developer, is so anxious to get off, get out of the, out from under this piece of property. Um, and secondly, he'd probably be willing to give us a first option at no charge and let us spend a year doing our due diligence before we purchase the property and make sure it's going to work for what we intend for it. So it's just really ridiculous to, there, there's a problem with the grade of the road and the railroad crossing. I've been in touch with VTrans. They are not willing to forfeit that spur. They need that spur. Uh, the, so just a few tens of feet in from route two, there's a railroad crossing for those who aren't familiar. And that's a spur that goes, you know, another hundred yards up the road and they need that place for parking trains. Um, but that limits the ability to regrade the road to be a safe intersection with route two. And that may be why Steve Ribellini is getting out from under it, you know, but the fact that the city manager went looking at other options to bring a road into there tells me that he's aware there's a problem with that intersection. And that the fact that that's not disclosed to the public before they make a bond vote is, is troublesome. Uh, the, the confluence park is, uh, the point was well made by another person that um, we can't maintain the parks we've got to spend another 600,000. It's like, like I said, again, drunken teenagers spending money with a, you know, their parents' checkbook and uh, no accountability. Th these, Pipers are going to come to pay after y'all have lost your office, and uh, I I just think it's it's time to rein in. I have a question about the bond, the bonding, because since it, it seems that the two minute warning, which I protest, uh, I think it's a violation of open meeting law. Um, but the what percentage of the two million we're going to put into paving? What percentage of the overall demand for paving? And of the number of feet of sidewalk that we're going to replace, what percentage of the overall demand? And is there even a plan to actually complete the sidewalks that are a real hazard along both sides of School Street, along Main Street, along State Street? I mean, it appears that we're giving, you know, lip service and, and you know, uh, to these these projects that we're decades and tens of millions of dollars in the hole. And I'd like to hear an intelligent answer about what, how we're gonna get caught up on all the overdue maintenance if we keep spending money like it's make, growing on trees. Thank you. Uh, so I don't know if I can answer all of these and I certainly can't speak for Steve Ribellini. I will say that Mr. Whitaker just made a boldly false statement and if he's not prepared to back it up, he needs to talk about it. 
Uh, I have not looked at a new road option other than to say, what could we do to supplement, you know, any property, is there a chance to connect it? We have had no planning for new roads. I don't know where you're getting your information, but it's time to put up or shut up. Okay. Um, any other um, comments or questions? Okay, I am not seeing anybody. Um, I do want to, um, I, I, I did make you wait, uh, Joe Castellano. Um, if you would like to uh, come back and respond um, previously, that this now is perfectly fine. If not, that's okay too. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody who had spoken once had the opportunity to speak. Um, so, and I, I know Joe, your hand's not raised, but I want to at least um, uh, give you that opportunity. I don't know if you're there, Joe. Okay. Um, all right, um, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. I don't know if you want to have me talk now or close the public hearing and have council members talk after that, but, but I, I, I just want to tell, uh, did, did you want to say something before I started? You know what, I, I think um, I, I'll um, close the public comment time on this after council has had a chance to weigh in case um, folks have further thoughts. Um, okay, thanks. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just want to say how uh, important I think this uh, development is and how, what a, uh, high priority for the city is it is we know that uh, we have a tremendous shortage of housing in Montpelier and affordable housing but housing for uh, every every income level and uh, it's been identified as the number one uh, priority of our uh, economic development strategic plan specifically because of how important it is for uh, for the future of Montpelier, um, there are there are no other properties like this that uh, have the opportunity to be uh, owned by the city of Montpelier, where we can drive and control the type of housing that gets developed, the location of the housing that gets developed, and uh, and we can plan for the new neighborhoods that will be developed on this land. Um, what we have now, I've talked to uh, the president of at least one of our larger uh, corporations in, in Montpelier saying that they have a hard time hiring people because the people who they want to offer jobs to can't find places to live in Montpelier. It's, it's not just stores and restaurants. It's, uh, it's companies that pay uh, very high salaries and uh, would bring families with children to live in our community, to uh, revitalize our community and uh, send their kids to our schools. I know that some of the people who are opposed to uh, this uh, development are expressing uh, environmental concerns and, uh, and they want to be sure that the city of Montpelier is protecting our environment. But we have people who are working in Montpelier who are commuting from Chittenden County every day. And anyone who thinks it's ir environmentally irresponsible to be, uh, to be developing this land uh, in the city of Montpelier, what do you think about how how environmentally responsible is it for people to be driving forty miles each way from uh, Burlington to Montpelier for jobs when they could be uh, making a short commute within the city of Montpelier? There are uh, we need a recreation center and uh, and the current building will never meet the needs of the city. We have lead and asbestos hazard 
in that building. We have, uh, it's limited to the footprint. We have no parking there. That will never be uh, adequate to meet the needs of the city. Uh, the fact that we're faced with the opportunity to become the owner of 138 acres to develop housing, develop neighborhoods, develop uh, recreation, uh, a recreation center and outdoor recreation and conserved lands all in that, uh, in that parcel is just, uh, I, I don't call that a once in a generation uh, opportunity. I think it's more like a once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, if, if the time comes, if, if we don't do this now, and if, the, uh, and if this parcel is sold to someone else and, uh, and we lose control over what's happened to the land, uh, future generations will, uh, will rightly criticize us for uh, letting this oppor opportunity go. I think it's very important that we uh, pass this bond and, and proceed with this project. Thank you, Thank Jack. You. Um, I just want to add to that. Um, I appreciate the environmental concerns um, about the Bells Club. That um, is a totally fair question, but I also just want to observe that um, any development there would have to conform to our um, uh, zoning regulations, which do have environmental protections built into them, uh, you know, concerning steep slopes or um, uh, things like uh, wetlands and uh, other sort of sensitive um, areas like that. So uh, just uh, something to put in the mix of the conversation there. Um, Connor Casey, go ahead. All right. And has Peter joined us, Mayor? I, I I don't know if I should be Peter speaking has, in hush tones or yes. anything if uh, he's sleeping. <laughs> yeah, he may make an appearance in a little bit. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I just want to say, it's a, I think it's a testament to the city, the level of public engagement on this item. Uh, but like, like many Vermont communities, I think we're facing a choice. It's like you're either busy growing or you're busy dying. You know, we live in one of the smallest postage stamps of land in the entire state here. And I think a couple of stats to like throw out there, the, the housing task force came and said, we sell less than a hundred homes a year. The average price of rent is $1,600 a year in town. It, it, it's, it's not sustainable. If we're worried about affordability, it's not sustainable. So we have a choice here. It's either define or be defined by an outside entity who could come in and do whatever they want with the land. I mean, if we want to dump like $7 million into an antiquated building on Barry Street, we, we certainly can, but it's not a forward thinking approach. In a, in a community where it snows about seven months a year, we need recreational activities. We've done it for decades. We've provided these services and we need it more than ever in the course of a pandemic, I think, where sort of the younger population is looking for opportunities to get out of the house and do something. So by, by purchasing this land, we can take an incremental approach. We can control it. We can build responsibly. We can preserve wildlife. And, and I think we can meet the needs of a growing community. So I, I know it's asking a lot of folks to accept this. But, you know, you have our commitment that we're, we're going to have a, a robust community engagement process on what to do with the land. Um, but, but just saying no thanks. I, I mean, I, I think that shirks our responsibility. And, and we lose control of, like Jank said, once in a lifetime opportunity. So just went away in there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Connor. Um, any other comments from council? Yes, Donna, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great words, Jack, Connor, really appreciate it. And I think it puts a flavor there that the council discussed this in intensely and supported it unanimously. And it makes me think back to the days being here, some 53 years in Montpelier, that around 20 years ago, Sabin's pasture, we actually had a bond trying to buy Sabin pasture. And there was a developer who wanted to put 600 units on it. 
And the Friends of Save and Pasture got born somewhere in the early 2000s because people didn't want to see that kind of development. But what happened was we spent a lot of time talking about Savings Pasture, city discussions, city forums, staff time, but we didn't own the land. And in the end, any reconciliation, any negotiation with the landowners fell through. Even as recently as since I've been on the council, we had a round in 2014, 15, 16, even as late as 2018 with zoning, trying to look at that land, trying to negotiate something that would work for what the city was told by its residents it wanted for recreation as well as housing. And it didn't, it fell through. So I'm thinking, isn't it better to put our time into land once we own it than to speculate when you don't own something? So I feel in this case, looking back in history can be very, very helpful. And I understand all of us approach projects differently. Some of us love the map first and some of us get on the train and then look at the map. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity. I, I really want people to understand this council does expect to do a lot of planning, a lot of research, a lot of community input, but we wanna jump on it because it is a lifetime opportunity to do that which we've already heard our citizens want. So thank you, thank you for being here. Please consider what we've been talking about and I hope you'll support the purchase of this land. Thank you. Great, thank you. And um, any other counselors wish to speak? Uh, yes, Jennifer, go ahead. I wasn't gonna say anything, but I, then I just got moved to say something. So, um, <clears throat> you know, everything that I do is through a very cultural lens and um, the purchase of this land I think the reason why it resonates with me is because the next seven generations, what's going to be here for them? I have a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old, and this is the only town they've known, and this is where they want to be. And when we start talking about buying homes and like we might have to move to Barry or somewhere else, my kids, are, they can't fathom that because all they've known is Montpelier. And I don't want to leave. <laughs> I love it here. I love this little town so much. and. Um, and it's not just my family, it's my neighbors, it's other people in town and people on the other side of the river. Um, so it feels very important to me to at least um, try um, because we don't know what's gonna happen. And um, there, there needs to be some space for the next generations that are coming up. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, and uh, just any um, final thoughts from uh, from folks, including the public, on uh, on any of this? I have a thought. Can you hear me? Um, yes. And uh, uh, my, would you say your name? Where my name you live. Jane, my my name's Jane Cast. I live in Montpelier, in District Two. And I, I, I'm of the persuasion that an insufficient amount of work has been done to look at, at planning, specific planning for what the space will be. And let me tell you what's been reinforced about that for me tonight. You might recall when there was a discussion about homeless people tenting in Hubbard Park. And to me, that brings together the biggest clash in, in poor people and people with, with resources sharing space. Now, if Jack McCullough can produce a housing plan and show us what affordable housing really looks like, so really poor people could live there, next to racquetball courts and squash courts and a swimming pool, I'll be the first one to sign on. But I don't think we're there yet. That's it, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. 
Um, okay. I think um, I wasn't going to say anything either, but um, it seems very fruitless to be discussing and plan making all these plans for things that we don't own yet. Um, yes, I've been here long enough and I remember the Sabin's pasture stuff and all the other stuff. And uh, I just, I think that as Jack said, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the city of Montpelier. And I think if people vote this thing down um, and don't even let it get a chance to start, then they should, like Bill said, put up or shut up. Um, because at this point, if you're not even going to support the initial, the beginnings of an opportunity for the city uh, residents and voters to decide what they want to do on a piece of property that we will never have the opportunity to purchase again, um, then, then maybe they should stop complaining about all the other stuff they complain about. Um, and I just, you know, people are always complaining about housing and stuff, and here's our opportunity. They complain about the the Berry Street Rec Center, which I've never been in. Um, it's it's not it's not feasible for me to be in it. Um, there's no parking. There's no access. Um, then I don't know. What are you going to do? Um, I just think that uh, people are being unbelievably short-sighted in not supporting this purchase. I mean, we can always sell it again. Maybe we'll get. Um, I mean, look at how much it's supposedly appraised since Steve bought it. So maybe we can make ourselves a couple more million dollars if we have to sell it. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to uh, say, uh, I, I didn't quite catch her name, but the woman uh, who's disbelieving that poor people and wealthy people can coexist. Um, Montpelier has a long history of uh, ha building low-income housing in areas where rich people live. And the coexistence has been terrific. Um, there's uh, there's low-income housing downtown. There's low-income housing um, off of, um, uh, quite near the, the rec center, off, off, of, uh, off of Elm Street, back by, I um, forget the name of the road. Um, there's uh, low-income housing in, on Northfield Street, uh, up uh, in, uh, near uh, behind Dan Jones' house, near where Habitat. And dispersed low-income housing um, is, is a long tradition in Montpelier. And it's way better than concentrating poor people in one area and, then, and having wealthy enclaves in one area. So I actually am very hopeful about this. And I don't think it's going to take Jack McCullough to have to design it. You're off the hook, Jack. Thank you. Um, Hi, yes, I um, am wanting to sort of buzz in for Steve again. And Steve, I'm going to ask that you stop unmuting yourself. I, I've seen you. I just want your noise to not um, interact with anyone else who's speaking. So um, I've seen you and I'll raise my hand for you. And uh, go ahead, Steve. But I think you may be muted. Yeah, she, I, she had me unmuted and I muted myself. Um, okay. I guess I'd like to know why we haven't had any answer to why we just can't get a right of first refusal on this property while we do our due diligence. If it's gonna work, it's gonna work through more planning and more community support. We don't need another thing like a garage to divide this community. And $2 million is not pocket change, no matter who you are. And so, you know, to put the, put the community in debt for $2 million before we know whether the road access is gonna work, whether we know how much housing it could support, whether we know what, you know, demands the 
uh, tennis club is going to make or walk away. Uh, It's just really irresponsible and premature. So uh, I guess why are we not hearing why we haven't pursued a right of first refusal, a first option on the property rather than a purchase? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, Bill, do you want to speak to that at all? Um, Not, I mean, I don't have a lot of details. We obviously discussed a lot of things with the landowner and we ended up where we ended up. Um, And certainly we did discuss that possibility and that wasn't where we ended. Okay, thank you. Um, Diane Derby, go ahead. Thanks. I'm just wondering if we've had any discussions with Downstreet about the likelihood of them partnering with us on the project there? Great question. We, Thank we, you. Um, we haven't talked to Di- to Downstreet yet, in part because they're in um, kind of a pretty significant transition right now of leadership, uh, but they are certainly on our list of uh, people to be talking with. We've got a short list of housing folks. We've done a lot of work with how- Downstreet, as you, as you know, Diane. We did the Transit Center with them. We did the French Block with them. We've done some of the land along Berry Street with them. So we have a very strong working relationship with Downstreet. Certainly would look to them. I, I would just encourage it because I think we're in a place right now. We, we're talking all night tonight about affordable housing. And I think we've all seen the stories that the cost of construction is so high right now that nothing's really affordable housing. So I'd really encourage the city, maybe even before... <laughs> Our, meet, our town meeting to or the vote to um, just see if they're, you know, if they'd be a, a willing participant. But I know it's still <coughs> pretty preliminary. Yeah. Uh, and, and just so you know, we're also working with them on um, uh, indirectly, uh, we're not the lead on the Christ, potential Christchurch housing. So yep. they've got a lot going and they've got a lot going. In the town. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, any further comments or questions? Okay, I'm not hearing anybody or uh, seeing. Um, Cameron, did you have another? Yes, um, Linda Berger unmuted, but I'm I'm not sure. I don't. I hate to put people on the spot. I just want to make sure that folks are being heard. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, Linda, um, Linda Berger, do, would you like to make a comment? No, and I'm showing myself as muted, so I'm confused. Sorry. It's all good. No worries. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've got a small human over here you may be hearing. Um, in any case, uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing. And um, I would <laughs> hang on one second. I'm gonna pa- I'm gonna pass. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so okay, so I'm gonna close the public hearing on that. But I want to thank um, Eddie who came out to make comments um, about this. I think there were really excellent um, comments and questions and thoughts and um, really appreciate everybody um, taking the time to uh, to participate this evening. Um, so thank you. Um, and so I, we are, we're gonna move on now um, to our the next item, uh, which is the park, uh, sorry, was that, were you? Yes, go ahead, Bill. Uh, just two things, if I may, one, um... Just to be 100% clear, I was quoted by Vicki Lane recently and about the put up or shut up. I want to be clear that was not at all related to any voters or any people participating in this meeting other than one person who made an inaccurate false accusation about me. So I just wanted to I understand. Make sure that, yeah, make I didn't that's mean clear. <laughs> and, uh, but secondly, uh, to follow up with the mayor, um, this is one of the highest turnouts we've ever seen at a budget or pu- bond public hearing over my long career here and the last couple of meetings. And um, so I really appreciate all the comments and the feedback and the questions. And, uh, you know, I know people, some people like this format and some people don't, um, but it, it's certainly we've had great participation in the last couple of meetings. And so I, I think it's wonderful that folks in the city have tried to get educated and tried to come out and participate. So thank you all. 
Um, I also want to thank you, Bill, for uh, your um, participation in the Front Porch Forum discussions, just making sure that folks have um, accurate information and uh, you know keeping up with uh, the questions that uh, come up there. So appreciate that. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, um, so Vicky, if you have anything more to say, you keep it short <laughs> um, because we're going to move I just on. Wanted, I just was going to apologize to Bill for, <laughs> you know, but that phrase just kind of quickly came out. And by the way, Peter did have something to say. You just wouldn't let him. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I was uh, going to let his papa figure out what he was trying to say. But anyway. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, Okay, so we are moving on. Thanks again, everybody, um, for that. And so the next item is the Parklet Ordinance, um, which uh, is to um, renew the temporary Parklet Ordinance for um, 2022. Um, I have one comment on this. Two, I have two comments on this just to get us kicked off, I suppose. Um, one is I think we should renew it, number one. Number two, I uh, would like to see us uh, adopt this ordinance permanently into our ordinances. We don't have to keep renewing it as a temporary measure um, every year. Um, to be fair, um, I think that might take um, a couple of meetings to do, uh, but uh, anyway, that's at least where I want to start. Um, thoughts from either Bill or Cameron to kick us off about this. And anything you want to say, Bill or, or Cameron? Well, my so my only point in bringing this up was even though it's uh, February, you know, I think our the Parkland ordinance begins in like April or May, so it's coming right up, and I felt like. Um, we wanted to give our downtown businesses as much lead time to plan as possible. We, you know, if we're going to do this, you can't actually adopt this necessarily tonight. We would have to go, you know, have, have the public hearings, et cetera. But I wanted to see where people were. And I was going to raise the option as this would be the third year. Is this something you want to just do permanently? And we could set it up that way. But um, I was really looking for direction from the council as to whether you wanted to do this at all this year. And if so, did you want to do it temporarily or permanently? And then we put it in the meeting queue. Okay. Um, other, well, you know where I stand <laughs> on that and at this point. Um, other thoughts from uh, council? And then if there's comments from the public, we'll take uh, comments from the public as well. Um, Connor, go ahead. Now, I've already been contacted by about five businesses on this. And uh, I, Langdon Street Tavern, so to say specifically, a couple of years ago, 80% of their business was actually the parklet outside. It, it kept them going, you know? Um, so they really want to get on the front end of this. I, I, I think it's been a tremendous asset to, to the city. I think folks love like the option of having like outdoor dining and like drinks. Um, so I would definitely like support adopting it on a long-term basis. Um, I, I, I've had a couple of businesses like want to get into the details of it, like loading zones and everything. But I, I think if we adopt this, like it's at the discretion of the city manager, right, Bill? So like they can discuss that with you like on an individual basis. But uh, long, long story short, totally support it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It's I, if I just throw one thing in here um, that I do think you want to consider as you have this conversation We've allowed um, the temporary structures to be what they are, temporary structures uh, based on some guidance from VTRANS as to what they would allow for temporary structures. The, the permanent ordinance has a, 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 a more, rest not restrictive, but a better, better design, requires a more permanent design, like what we see at Positive Pi, what we see at Capitol Plaza, a little bit more road safety. So, I think we'd want to consider that if we were to go forward, you know, what you may want to do is do the temporary for this summer so that people can do what they've been doing, but move toward a permanent ordinance where people actually have to construct safer structures, more solid structures, you know, they cost some money. So, you know, it's one thing to just throw out a few chairs and a, 
and uh, you know some things around and call it a, a parklet, but it, it, there, there really should be barriers between vehicles and those kinds of things. So uh, th there is a difference in what we require for the parklet structures between the temporary and permanent ordinance. And so you wanna give some thought as to how you wanna handle, handle that. Because I think at some point, VTrans is gonna weigh in and say, you know, this doesn't meet road standards. That's fair. And it also seems like if we do um, a longer or a more robust uh, permanent option, that early gives businesses time to plan. Um, sooner we can do that, or if we need to forward date it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it would take more than just this year. I'd be interested in hearing about that businesses as to whether, like how long it might take them to, to go through that planning process. Um, but anyway, that I, that's, that's fair. Other comments or questions? Uh, Donna, go ahead. My, my question is if indeed it seems that council members are favorable and moving forward to this, then do we have two public hearings? Is that how we proceed? I should think so. I, you know, as with any other um, ordinance change. Is, is that your understanding, Bill? Yeah, because it was an ordinance, it was a temporary ordinance that actually, you know, we set an expiration date. So the temporary ordinance expired. So even if we were to do a new temporary ordinance, we'd have to enact it following the ordinance enactment process for this coming summer. Or if you wanted to amend the permanent ordinance to, to expand it or however you wanted to do it, that would require the public hearing process. So either way, we're gonna have two public hearings. This was really, I just want to introduce the topic and see where you're at because we've, you know, it's coming fast. Hopefully it's coming, the good weather is coming faster than we think. It's fun to think about it anyway. Is this language that you've given us tonight a good place to start? Uh, I, I, um, I believe we gave you the, the temporary ordinance language that you've enacted in the last two years. So if, if you wanted to do that, yes, that's fine. But if you wanted to so I think part of it is where do you want to go? And what do you want to do? We can react with language at, for, at the next meeting with the first public hearing. So if I wanted to make a motion that we move towards a permanent ordinance, then that would give staff direction or can we just all give a nod and the mayor tell you to go do that? <laughs> motion is always better. Okay, I do a motion that we do is kind. Do a permanent ordinance, a parklet ordinance. And this is just to be clear, this is um, separate from approving the temporary ordinance for this summer. Yes. Okay. So is there, and it's, it's a moving in that direction, is that right? Yes. Okay. And okay, so there's a second from Jack. Um, about this particular thing, the idea of moving towards a permanent ordinance uh, allowing for parklets. Um, any further discussion from council? Uh, Jack. Thanks. I, I think that it was, uh, that it's really been successful. People have appreciated uh, the opportunities. I don't really know whether uh, we're going to be in a position to address every potential issue to have a permanent ordinance in effect for this this coming season but i'd certainly be happy to to work toward that you know starting with uh, like doing a side by side comparison of what the permanent ordinance is and cuz as i think the permanent ordinance is what's in effect right now, because the temporary ordinance that we've adopted has been for a couple of years to suspend the permanent ordinance during the time that the pe te temporary ordinance is in effect. But uh, so I, I think Bill makes some excellent points about uh, the structural integrity of, uh, of parklets. Um, I know that in years past when the ordinance was originally adopted, it had some uh, maybe stricter limitations on the number of parking spaces that could be uh, taken up than, than maybe we think we want, given, given a couple of years 
of experience with the uh, with a more wide open uh, rule. So I, I think we should be moving forward. Okay. Thank you, um, Cameron. Hi, sorry, I was just raising my hand for uh, Stephen Whitaker. Okay, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I want to raise a couple issues. I raised uh, back when the temporary ordinance was in place or being renewed that uh, the city manager abused his discretion by granting parklet space in fire lanes. The the ordinance and the temporary ordinance was never, it was made, made for parking places, not fire lanes. And he granted permission uh, to put, to block a fire lane in the truck drivers and I don't, I didn't see any, I didn't FOIA any uh, feedback from the fire chief on that. But, you know, to hear the truck drivers say, that, you know, this has made our delivery process and our in ingress and egress, you know, dangerous and, and have it been granted. And then this is not a, just a renewal of the temporary because this grandfather's in anything he prior granted. And I, I read the, the, proposed temporary ordinance and it grandfathers things in if he if he made a mistake already so that's just really out of this is the kind of diligence that uh we've come to expect so i i just raise a real red flag here and in the context of the downtown core master plan having been reliant upon the parking garage and now we need to and it's not even in the budget to redo the downtown core master plan we're forfeiting parking you know, that we considered so sank or sanct. I mean, we really need to do the downtown core master plan without the garage before we know whether it's smart to do a permanent uh, parklet ordinance. So there's some things to chew on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions on um, Donna's motion, which is... Yeah, I'd, I'd... I guess I'd like some yeah, clarification uh, just to make sure I know what you're voting on. Like I said clarity was kind, but then I'm not clear. Um, the motion was to pursue a permanent ordinance. And so I guess I'm, are we talk? are you talking about a permanent ordinance that would go into effect this summer? So we'd be amending the current ordinance to ex presumably to expand to at least the types of parking that we have now not necessarily grandfathering, assuming that they met, but that they would then meet the higher standards so that people would have to incur the costs of new construction for parklets uh, for those that don't meet the standard now. Or are you talking about working on a more permanent ordinance and at the same time re-upping the temporary ordinance for this summer while we prepare the more permanent ordinance? The I guess for my motion, Bill, it would depend if you needed more time. If I guess I was pursue, wanting the staff to pursue the permanent ordinance and then the council to look at that and say, OK, it's achievable. Let's do it this year or oh, no, we'll do the permanent next year and we'll do the temporary. But I guess I need to study the differences between the two. But meanwhile, I didn't want the work on the permanent one not to get done. Understand. I get. I'll be frank here. I think the issue of the time is less about city staff drafting an ordinance and more about the users of the, the parklets. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about the business owners here. If if people that have had a temporary parklet and are expecting that again this year have to now construct what. Okay. I believe is in the thousands of dollars. I don't know exactly how much they cost. I think it depends on what you do, how fancy you make it. Um, that, you know, we might want to hear from them about that uh, in terms of what that impact is and whether they can pull that together in time for this year or whether saying this is your last year at temporary, this is what the rules are going to be starting 2023. That gives people a year to plan and decide whether they want to continue it and know that they need to set money aside or whatever. I, so I'm actually, I think we can draft an ordinance and we can tweak it over a course of a couple of hearings in terms of the city's end of it. I don't think it's that difficult. Um, and 
some of the questions that have been raised tonight, certainly we would be, we could address. Um, but the the users might have a different perspective on that. That maybe my motion needs an addendum. <laughs> <laughs> want to clarify your that that we use the temporary ordinance this year while we work on a permanent one and jack's okay with that um okay <laughs> uh okay so that's that also makes sense to me um particularly in terms of giving businesses time to plan and um get financing together for a permanent um parklet if that is what they want to do um yeah go ahead donna but, but i do think if there's a at least a, a little step or whatever if there needs to be a, a step to make things safer even if they aren't as safe as they ultimately would be then i think that should be clear to people this year too though even if it's a temporary ordinance that we talked to them the staff talked to them and encourage whatever additions that you feel would make it safer without within the reasonable ability of being temporary. Does that make sense? Sure. I, and I, and I'm not, I really don't want to belabor this, but there are very clear, I mean, federal highway and others have standards for these things that, and these are on federal aid, well, at least state street and main street of federal aid highways. I don't know about Langdon um, that they would need to meet um, in a more permanent basis. So uh, and it includes all sorts of things. Uh, and we have all that. So I would I would propose that if we that that's where we'd want to go. So what we, you know whatever we can do this year to make them safer, of course. Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, uh, any other comments from council or the public? Okay. Uh, all right. So there's been a motion and a second uh, establishing the temporary ordinance for this summer and pursuing a more permanent one um, for the future. Uh, okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So that passes. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, Bill, for getting this on the agenda. I think uh, hopefully our businesses appreciate that as well, because I am looking forward to spending some time outside in a parklet, hopefully sometime this summer. Um, and uh, all right, so I think that is the the last like um, you know big piece of business that we have. Um, so we are on to council reports, and I'm going to start with Donna. I would like, maybe it's more on other business to talk about our March meetings. Uh, in January, I made a motion to have February meetings remote. And I do feel like we need to do that one more month. The numbers have started going down and that's great. We also just had February break. So, and I wanna, I mean, again, I think it's, I prefer us all to be remote and I would like the mayor to participate. And I feel like you really absolutely have to be. So I'd make the motion that we make the March meetings remote. And then at the last meeting in March, assess what the data is and see if we can go forward to be in person. Sorry, you just made a motion, is that? We Second. go remote for the March city council meetings. The council okay, itself. There, so there's a motion and a second. Um, Go remote for March. Other thoughts on that from council or the public? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I think people know that I really prefer being in person than being remote, but, uh, but we've had some encouraging uh, statistics the last couple of weeks and hopefully that continues, but uh, it was, you know, 56 degrees when I got up this morning and that didn't me, make me think winter was over. And, <laughs> and, and last week's uh, case rates didn't make me think that the pandemic is necessarily over either. And so uh, given the fact that there are uh, people on the council with really uh, serious and well-founded concerns about, uh, about their health, if they were to uh, have to come back to meetings in person, um, I, I think it makes sense to uh, 
go another month and, and reassess. Okay, um, Vicki and Lane, go ahead. Um, I was just thinking that maybe that's not fair to whoever's going to be new on the council because they won't get the experience of being able to sit in those chairs and and know what it's like. They'll just it just be another Zoom meeting for them. So I think for the new people, I think it would be good to have them. And you actually are pretty far away from each other for the most part on the council. Um, if you don't like breathe into each other's spaces. So, but anyway, I just thought it would be better for new people. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any further thoughts? On this, uh, Whitaker. Steve, go ahead. I I just want to stand up for the folks that uh, I mean I can only participate by telephone, but some people can't even do that. And you're you know taking actions on consultant studies for the unhoused, and your you know showers and rec center. I mean you're disenfranchising folks by technology for your own comfort. And we have air cleaners, we have social distancing, we have a public building that we're paying for, we should damn well use it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further comments on this? Uh, Jay. I guess I'll just add that um, as the short timer, um, I, I do feel a little bit uncomfortable even on, on somewhat of a small, I mean, I, not, not disregarding how important it is, but um, uh, I do feel uncomfortable making decisions for, for somebody else. And so um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if it would be possible to at least establish that the, the first meeting in March would be, would be remote. Um, I can't remember exactly what that date would be, um, but then that would then give the opportunity to revisit um, uh, the rest of the month's um, meetings staying remote. Personally, I I, I absolutely supported one hundred percent to commit to um, to to the first you know to to March, but think that you know there it might make sense to have a quick revisit as you know it, it, with uh, any new members of the with new members of the council. I'll just throw that in. Thanks. It's a great point. Um, go ahead, Donna. Well, it's just that if you have health reasons, they don't go away and and it will be harder on new members and I can make myself available again to talk to them on phone as I try to do with, with new members and meet remote. But I feel the health reasons don't go away. And so for March, they're there. So I, I feel that it's not a matter of comfort. It's it's a matter of health for us and the people we're around. You know, what's possible too is that, I mean, so um, even if we vote to go remote for March, um, you know, new council comes in for their first meeting on March 9th, um, they could, we could <laughs> vote to, um, yep. Uh, to to go you know to be in person for the next week like they could undo um yep. you know any decision that we make tonight potentially if if there's the, a desire to so um so uh, anyway just i'm throwing that in for you know a little context uh okay any any other comments or questions on this Okay, so there's been a motion and a second. Um, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right, so we'll be remote in March unless the new council decides otherwise. Um, okay, um, so thank you. Anything else, Donna? No, for my council report, I really appreciate Bill taking all the wax tonight. I felt like I didn't want to confuse things except my little piece about Saban's pasture, but thank you very, very, very much. You did extremely well, Bill, appreciate it. And Cameron, likewise on your report uh, for the 
task force. Uh, and everybody vote on Tuesday. Support the budget, support the bonds, support the re-election of those council members who are already on the council. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, Connor. I'll echo the gratitude for city staff, really good presentation tonight. And really thank everybody for coming out. Um, Jay, it feels so hollow having the last meeting with you over Zoom. It, it's like a prison window where you want to push your hand up against a glass, right? <laughs> so so I, I really think uh, hopefully we can maybe have a good send off for Jay in, in person at some point. Um, he, he brought such a depth of knowledge to the council and uh, really appreciate his service over the last couple of years here. Uh, but like Donna said, I hope everybody gets out and votes on town meeting day and uh, look forward to seeing everybody in March, hopefully. Uh. Hey, thanks, Jay. Go ahead. All right. I'm going to keep it quick. Um, it's It's been an honor uh, serving, serving uh, District 3. Um, it's been an honor serving with all of you, even Lauren in absentia. Um, uh, I am incredibly thankful for all of you, uh, council and staff, and um, I've left very optimistic about our city hearing, hearing the presentations from staff tonight, and, and in particular, the, um, the forward thinking and passionate words from my fellow current council members um, about the importance of not only the small bond, but about how we are thinking about and planning for our city and doing best, not just for the now, but for generations to come. And so I'm not going anywhere. I've st I'm still, I'll, I'll still live in downtown Montpelier and I'm, my, I'm still raising my kids here. Um, and uh, so, but I'm left optimistic thinking, knowing that we have the leadership that we have here. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I mean, just like echoing what everybody else has said about staff tonight. And I, I really, this meeting felt really good. Um, and it may be my last, I don't know, we won't know until everybody's done voting. And if I am not reelected, I have really truly enjoyed this experience, um, understanding politics more and my neighbors more and how the city functions. And it's been a really great learning experience for my kids as well, which I didn't even think would be a thing, but um, they, you know, they listen and they're paying attention and it's been really, truly an honor. Um, and if I do get voted to stay on, I look forward to all of the upcoming projects and sitting next to all of these lovely human beings that I've gotten to know over the course of winter. Um, and um, I will be around as, as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jack. Thank you. Um, two, uh, probably just two things. I uh, echo the uh, comments that I've heard. Uh, com uh, town meeting day is Tuesday, you still have a chance to vote uh, by uh, early voting before then. But if you're not there, we have uh, volunteers ready to take your vote on election day. Please come out and vote and vote for, uh, for Donna, for Connor, and for uh, Jennifer, and uh, my dear friend, Mayor Watson, and for all the budget items. Um, and then the other thing I want to say is that we uh, we had the vote to formally extend the uh, contract of the city manager tonight. And I want to say that uh, once again, at this meeting, Bill uh, demonstrated uh, why we are uh, so fortunate to have him as a city manager by his uh, professionalism, his command of the vast array of facts of every aspect of, uh, of city government and, uh, and the ethical way in which he uh, conducts the business of the city. And I am very glad that we have been able to secure his services for, uh, for another 
four year contract. And uh, I think the people of the city can be secure that the management of their government is in very good hands. Great. And that's all I've got. Um, thank you. And uh, so I've got a, a couple of things um, on my radar. Um, one, well, first, um, uh, uh, Jay, I just want to say thank you so much um, for your time and dedication to the city. And um, I have I've appreciated working with you, but also I am up for re-election. And so I want to say in general, I've had really appreciated working with all of you. Um, and it's been just a, a delight. And I hope that I will see you here again on March 9th. Um, and, uh, but uh, particularly uh, since Jay is leaving, I just want to make sure that we don't um, forget that Jay was appointed to the uh, stormwater in, um, utility committee and um as he will i think we appointed him you know knowing that he was on the council and we created one community at large seat and i think that was filled by jim condos uh and so jay if i'm not mistaken you were willing to stay on um that committee but do you want to speak to that at all um yeah i'm willing i'm willing to stay on for sure um until, yeah, obviously it, it sort of has to, the, the committee itself has to establish an identity and figure out exactly what the representation should be. And I'm happy to be a part of it through that transition. And if that means I stay on it longer term um, as at large or in some other capacity, that's fine. But um, if, or, and then if it means, otherwise, if it means that, yeah, we, the, the representation should be as it is and I step off, then that's okay too. So um, I'm happy to, to be a part of the conversation to manage the transition. Lifetime appointment, man. Lifetime appointment. You're dreaming. You're dreaming, Connor. Um, one possibility is that we can try to, if there's an easy solution, we can try to just figure that out right now, or we can put it on a future agenda to hash out. Um, I don't know that it needs to be on a future agenda, but, or what do you think, Jay? I'll leave it to you to decide. I mean, it's, it's going to be in your hands to decide exactly. It's a city committee, so you have to decide what the appropriate representation is. So, um, if you're, if somebody else wants to step in, or you want to, however you want to make it work. So, to be fair, one of the things like the press, um, there is precedent for other committees where um, if a, you know, if a council member does not want to step onto a committee, then um, they can have their designee. So potentially, you could be our designee. Um, uh donna yeah but just that the stormwater is meeting uh next friday i think it's one to two isn't it jay i forget exactly I'd yeah have to so look back. we we won't meet again to decide that before the stormwater committee meets yeah can okay. he can he can we ask him to go ahead and attend i'm attending for the uh mtic committee okay. but i'm not the council representative so could we direct him to attend and he can get his feet wet? <laughs> he, well, sure. And then stormwater. Well, well played. I'm sure that's exactly <laughs> what you meant. Yeah. And, um, so one possibility is that, so, so Jay, if it makes sense, you could stay on for that meeting and then we could just consider, cause we'll need to go through the whole slate of who is on what committees anyway. Again, Of course. Yeah. So that's fine. Can... That's fine by me. Like I said, I, I'm happy to, um, yeah, be a designee for that first one and we'll go from there. Okay. Jack, I know you had a hand up and I skipped you there. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say the same thing you said, which is that committee appointments are one of the things on our uh, March 9th agenda. So we can talk about that. And also I, I finished up without saying anything to Jay. Jay, it's been great uh, working with you on the council and we'll, we'll stay in touch in town. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So I think that seems like an okay plan team, unless folks have objections. Okay. Thank you um, again, um, Jay, for even just going to that one meeting. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, and uh, I also want to add that I have office hours this coming Sunday. 
at 2 p.m. Uh, if anyone would like to join for that, um, they just need to email me and I will send them a link. Um, and I'm hoping to do office hours on into the future after that. Um, and uh, so that's uh, ongoing. And I think that is, that is it for me. So thank you everybody. Um, uh, John Odom, go ahead. Oh, that's all I got. Just vote. And, and to be fair, um, if I may uh, pull a little more uh, out of you from, from that, um, if people have not requested a ballot at this point, should they or should they just plan on going into City Hall? Well, I mean, you know, you can request an early ballot anytime that's early, right? Um, if you want us to mail it to you at this point, you're taking a risk um, that it may not get to you in time. If you do have us mail you one, uh, my strong advice would be not to mail it back and instead to drop it off. Um, and there is the drop box in the back of City Hall that people are making great use of. So, okay. You and can so people stop by and vote too. Right. People could stop in in person yeah. to vote early. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Thank you. Um, First of all, I would like to, um, I'm a little curious how Council Member Casey knows so much about putting your hand up in a prison. To, just uh, look, yeah, no, they, 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 I was never convicted. It's just a, just a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks to Jay. It's really been great working with you and having our weekly phone calls and or, or sort of weekly phone calls. And uh, You've really been a top-notch council member, very uh, thorough. I, I appreciate it. It's been it's been really wonderful working with you. To um, the, all of you up for re-election, good luck. And to all the candidates running for election, good luck. Uh, to the voters, please vote on all of these important issues. The more of you that turn out, the better sense of the city we get on, on the budget, the bonds, the candidates, and everything. So that's really helpful to all of us. Um, and thank you to the city council for your continued confidence in me and our staff. Um, and so I, I really look forward to continuing to serve all of you or most of you and um, the residents of Montpelier do love this city. Appreciate the kind words about tonight. I really have to, to pass that along to the staff. If they did not provide me the information that I need to share, um, I wouldn't be able to do it. So, um, you know, I've I talk, but it's really, they're the ones that inform me. So uh, thanks to all of them. And uh, we'll see everybody Tuesday, I guess, on voting day. Um, thank you. And there's actually one more thing I wanna say, um, Jay, as you're stepping off and Jennifer, if you don't end up um, back with us by March 9th, I, I want your opinions. Um, uh, if you have thoughts about any future topics, um, please, please stay in touch. Um, okay, You'll having said Don't that, worry. okay, good. Uh, okay, having said that, uh, without objection, we will um, adjourn the meeting at 9 58. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good night, folks. Before 10, good night, folks. Thank you.